My name is Klaus Ramos-Philip, and I'll be chairing this meeting in place of our regular chair, uh, Commissioner Fudge. And we have a pretty full agenda today, so in the interest of holding an efficient meeting, please follow these meeting procedures. Ms. Friddle will introduce each item, and I'll ask if there is an applicant or representative present for each item. Please state your name and address and record it in the form located on the podium. I will then ask the commission whether there are any comments or concerns, and the applicant may then respond to any questions. Before the commission votes on each item, I'll ask if there are any members of the public uh, who wish to speak on that item. And anyone speaking will be given three minutes to relay information to the commission uh, members. If we stop this meeting for any reason and we are unable to continue, all remaining items will be moved to the next regularly scheduled Historic Preservation Commission meeting. This meeting takes place on Wednesday, May 4th at 2 p.m. right here in the City Council Chambers. The agenda and documents for today's meeting are located in the PrimeGov website. If you're following along, select agenda on the right side of the Historic Preservation Commission meeting to see the items being discussed. Written comments received more than 24 hours before today's meeting are posted online and were shared with the commission members. At this point, new materials may not be shared with the commission. So if you brought materials with you, please keep them at your seat and we, will, uh, we cannot accept and review those. Uh, Desiree, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Fudge. Commissioner Raymond Phillip. Present. Commissioner Corbin. Present. Commissioner Farzana. Commissioner Jordan. Present. Commissioner Meacham. Commissioner M Milner. Present. Commissioner Poor. Commissioner Ramey. Present. All right, thank you, Desiree. Uh, procedures for today's meeting are noted in the agenda. For the sake of time, I ask anyone who's unfamiliar with the process, please refer to the procedures section. There are two items we like to note specifically regarding the meetings process. Those items involve certificates of appropriateness and appeals. Regarding certificates of appropriateness, after an application is approved and the 10-day protest period has expired, the Historic Preservation Officer will mail the Certificate of Appropriateness to the applicant. City construction permits cannot be issued until a Certificate of Appropriateness is issued. Please contact HP staff for final design review inspection or to withdraw items that will not be completed. Regarding appeal to Board of Adjustments, any person aggrieved by decision granting or denying a Certificate of Appropriateness may appeal to the Oklahoma City Board of Adjustments. All appeals shall be made within 10 days of the Commission decision by filing a written notice of appeal with the clerk of the Board of Adjustments. Any news from the Historic Preservation Officer? I do not have anything to report at this time. I did want to confirm um, with uh, Desiree that we're recording now. If we're live, we're on live and on camera. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Katie. Um, acceptance of the minutes. Have commissioners had a chance to review the minutes from the March 2nd meeting? Do we have a motion? I motion to approve the uh, meeting minutes from March 2nd. I'll second that motion. Was that Commissioner Jordan? It was. Okay. And seconded by Commissioner Poor. Please vote. Are we waiting on someone or? Okay, there we go. All right. Um, that motion passes. Actually, you know, I apologize. I should have probably um, abstained since I was not at that meeting. I didn't even think about that. So I don't know if you need to. Okay. Sounds good. So uh, moving on, uh, Katie, anything from code enforcement report? I have nothing in particular to report for code enforcement. As always, if anyone has questions about cases that are in the code enforcement report, you can reach out to HP staff or to the city's action center for more information about those items. All right, thank you, Katie. Um, anything from, or do we have any continuance announcements or requests? We have no uh, new requests for uh, continuances. 
Okay. And uh, public hearings? We have nothing under dilapidated structures, and we have no National Register nominations this month. And we have four items under the consent docket. And these were all items that were recommended for approval with no conditions um, that by staff's assessment met all applicable guidelines and regulations. All right, has the commission had a chance to review the consent docket items? And do we have a motion on the consent docket? I motion to approve um, items one through four on the consent docket. I'll second that motion. Okay, Com uh, moved by Commissioner Jordan and seconded by Commissioner Poor. Please vote in prime gov. Oh, yeah, I apologize. Uh, do we have any public comment? Anyone want to speak on any of these items? No? Okay. And that motion was by Sarah Jordan, but we'll correct that in the minutes. It's fine. All right, and consent docket is approved. If you had an item on the consent docket, um, your case has been approved, so you um, may leave or hang around if you want to hear some of the other cases. Um, all right, moving on to cases for individual consideration. Um, HPCA 200139, item one. This is located at 240 Northwest 34th Street, Edgemere Park, Ward 2. Consideration of possible action on application by James and Janet Martin to 9, request final extension for item 1, construct garage and basement, elective, 2, replace retaining wall, 3, replace fence, 4, replace fence, 5, regrade backyard, 6, install generator, and 7, install drainage pipe to redirect water away from buildings, elective. So this is all work that was previously approved by the commission. They've been granted one, uh, extension administratively for six months. The next step after that six month extension is a one year extension that has to be granted by the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, this is one of many projects that we're hearing from that is having a really hard time getting started because of materials shortages, labor shortages, um, just due to COVID and everything surrounding that. So uh, little to no actual physical work has occurred at this time, but we did recommend approval um, of the extension, just basically based on the circumstances that we know are happening for lots of these projects right now. All right, thank you, Katie. Um, do we have an applicant here to speak on this item? All right, thank you. If you could state your name and address for the record. James Martin. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Oh, I'm sorry, and the address, please. Address and name, sorry. I'm, I'm not understanding you. Oh, just your, your address and your name. If, oh. you, if you can state your name yeah. and your address for okay. the record yeah. and sign J in on the sheet there. James Martin, 240 Northwest 34th Street. Yes. And sorry, let me know if you can't hear me. I've adjusted my mic, so maybe it'll be better. So, the, um, Does the commission have any um, questions or concerns on this item? It sounds pretty straightforward to me. You just need an extension um, so you can complete the work. So uh, I don't have any issues either if we have a motion or any other comment. Is there anyone from the public who wants to speak on this besides the applicant? So Katie, if, if the work is not completed by this year, then they will have to resubmit an application and come back before pay a new fee and everything. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep, they get two extensions, one for six months, one's one for one year, and then after that, they would have to reapply. Okay. Um, I'll move to approve HBCA 20-00139 with the uh, specific findings mentioned in the staff report. All right, thank you. That is moved by Commissioner Jordan. Do we have a second? I second that motion. All right, we have a second by Commissioner Meacham. Please vote in prime gov.
All right, and I think that was approved. I don't know if I ever got a summary. Yes, it showed up there that it was oh, motion okay. approved. All right, thank you. You are approved, and we are on to item two, HPCA 2100174. This is located at 710 Northwest 20th Street, Mesta Park, Ward 6. Consideration and possible action on application by Melissa Graham for Cap Crawford for certificate of appropriateness to one, close faux door and windows required, two, construct trellis required, and three, paint brick, mortar, and concrete sills required. And this application was heard previously in February, and they have one continuance remaining. Um, the staff, the commission, so the commission saw this previously. Uh, most of the new information that you have before you from the applicant is um, related to proposed landscaping in front of the trellises to further screen them. Um, all of this is work that has been completed previously and is being applied for um, retroactively. So staff had recommended a continuance. Um, again, um, there's information about installing salvaged windows and doors in the openings, but we felt that further detail was needed to clarify how that would be done since those openings have been closed off from the interior. Uh, we also felt there was further work that could be done in attempting to remove the paint from the brick. All right, thank you. Uh, Katie? And it looks like we have an applicant here um, for this item. Could you please state your name and address for the record? Uh, my name is Cap Crawford. My address is 710 Northwest 20th Street. All right, thank you very much. And do we have any questions or comments from the commission? I did bring booklets for each one of you. I saw this passed out at the last meeting. <clears throat> I have 14 copies, and this was all communicated by email um, two months ago. So it's all been given to the commission previously. I didn't know if you could use this to kind of follow along with each of my exhibits for, I've got three issues. If that's okay, I'll just, I could hand these out. We can pass them out. Okay. The commission's not, probably not gonna be able to sit and study them, but they can yeah, it's quick. have them in it's their a, hands. It's a quick look. And you said it's material that have been, that's been provided to the commission previously? Yes, uh, okay. by email. Okay. All right, thank you for that. So thank you, Katie and Angela. They've both been working with me. Um, and thank you all for volunteering to be here today to help with some solutions. I purchased this house um, May 2021. Um, I moved to this area to be a first responder with the Department of Justice. And um, thank you. Um, I did not know that I was moving to an area that was governed by the bylaws of this commission. I've lived uh, in Dallas, Texas in an older home. Um, and then other than the day that um, I was purchasing the house, when you check that box, um, I did not realize that I was being uh, creating infractions because I certainly came to the city to um, help make the city better and be a, a first responder. Um, that Changes that I made to the house were based on uh, deficiencies from the inspection report with hearth and home and um, privacy issues. First thing I did was to um, hire a professional to remove all the dead branches, which were creating a hazard in my yard and my neighbors, uh, and also laying down on the wires. I hired a plumber because all of the plumbing was leaking and deteriorating the wood. Um, also, my um, air conditioning was leaking into the ceiling, creating water damage. So I have basically um, gone under the house to remove all the debris to prevent any termite damage, uh, and then all the way up to the rafters, um, fixing problems that would seriously deteriorate this historic home. Uh, and it is my intention to preserve it. So um, the First item on the agenda is the exterior cracks, and I have numbered all the pages. So this is exhibit number one. Um, Hearth and Home noticed bulging 
um, and cracks to the exterior of the house. Um, they were significant. There was a family of four starling birds living in the brick. Um, there were holes for pests to come inside. So I had those holes um, shored up uh, with wood and mortar. Um, there is still, there still existed significant bulging, which I don't have a picture before the paint, but on the side of the house. That was noted in the uh, inspection report. Um, the patch jobs that had been done were like kind of oozing off into the, from the, the brick. So the paint actually helped to seal all of these things and preserve the house. Um, so I've got those two pictures. The, business cards you see there from Jonathan Moore, Certa Pro Painters. Uh, he came to the house and said that the paint cannot be removed. Um, and I just provided you with that so that you could uh, contact him if you need to. On page two, uh, this is, I went to Home Depot and asked them what they might recommend. This is what they recommended, and I did tell them it was a historic home. The product there is a plastic um, device so that it's intended not to hurt the brick. I sprayed that on and tried to remove it and as you can see, there's a peat moss substance that came out of the brick. I don't know if that was something that was used um, in brick making back in um, uh, 1911, but um, I don't think it's possible to remove the paint. I don't know if we want to, should I move on to the next? Well, let's, um, I appreciate you describing that. Um, maybe we just open it up to commissioners if they have specific questions and then we can just respond to any, you know, specific concerns or questions commissioners have. Okay. Yeah. What I'd be curious is when you came before us in February, I'd like to know what different, is, what things have changed in your proposal since then. Yes. Uh, quite a bit has changed, but what's different from the last time that I was here is that I had Jonathan Moore come over to my house and verify from a professional that the paint cannot be removed. It's not a flat brick, um, which I hope you can see from these pictures. It is a um, very indented brick, so um, once that is sealed, it's almost, or he says, it is impossible to remove that. So um, with that said about the brick, um, so we're looking at essentially the, the brick, the trellis, and the enclosure of the window and the doors, correct? That yes, but I haven't left? gotten okay. to those other two um, issues. In your submission, there's some work on the interior of the home that looks pretty new, maybe um, a kitchen and a bathroom. Is that something that you did after you bought the home or was that um, done previously? No, I did not do any okay. of that. Um, the reason that is there is to explain um, the second item, which is removing the faux windows and the doors. The plumbing is right, all they have between this was what they had when I moved in. Well, that's moving on to the next item, but I have a picture. That's okay. Of, that's number, yeah. page number three. Um, that's a picture of the house as it was, and um, a picture of the house highlighted showing areas where it was remodeled. When it was remodeled, they put these windows in. And um, when it was remodeled again before I purchased it, they gutted the house. That's what resulted in all of the debris being under the house and the termite problem. But um, when they gutted the house, they left drywall and this curtain and this window. So the drywall is right here. The picture of this plumbing, this plumbing abuts the drywall. 
so there's not space for a double hung window or anything of that sort. Okay. Um, so you, in theory, would only have one more continuance before this was either approved or denied after this meeting. Um, in the neighborhood comments, they indicate that they would support just actually denying it today, which we would probably all love not to deny it today if there's a way to I find have a place a, to meet in the middle. Um, that it, I have a petition signed by all of my neighbors. Yes, we received that too. Okay. Um, we have both Before comments. Before I did any uh, of the work, I asked them about that and they all were in favor of it. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it to me sounds like the brick is kind of at this point a non-issue because that would be a massive financial burden to go in and correct and I don't think that's anyone's goal here. Um, the trellis to me is I'm, I'm unoffended by your proposed solution to do plantings in front of it because it's um, to me very impermanent. So for me what I think we're coming down to is the enclosure of the windows and the doors and I'm just wondering if you are open to correcting those in a more historically appropriate fashion. You know, that part of the proposal has not changed from the February meeting to this meeting. And I think if we could, I can only speak for myself, but I think if we could come to a happy solution for the windows and doors, we could probably move past this. Okay, that is on page five and on page six. So I went to the um, dead people stuff because they have vintage doors that would be appropriate and I did locate a door that is pictured on page six and windows. Of course the windows will be um, painted according to appropriately, sanded and painted. I couldn't do that while they were still in the store. I purchased one and put a deposit down so that it would be held. Um, so I do have that, that door that I can put up but um, I'll have to be really careful because this is all that I have to work with. This space here and the insulation I put in, the insulation has to be in because uh, the heating and air conditioning was literally blowing out of holes from where these fake windows were. Katie, what would be the staff recommendation for the best way to remediate the um doors and windows. I know that stained glass windows don't typically fall, uh, they're not typically considered historically appropriate as per the guidelines um, other than I think in transoms and um, side windows on front doors. So the guidelines don't only support stained glass where we know that stained glass was present historically. If you had a house that had other stained glass windows then we might consider supporting you know additional stained glass or stained glass going back where maybe we don't know what the historic window was but in general um, most of our historic homes didn't have stained glass, and if there was not, if there's not stained glass present on the structure or documented as having been there previously, we wouldn't support stained glass. The guidelines say glass should be clear unless there's historic evidence of a different condition. Um, I think the other, the concern, and I'm very sympathetic to the situation you're in with trying to fit something into these openings that have been altered in such an unusual way, but I think what staff would want to see is detailed drawings of exactly how those windows and doors would be fit into those openings, um, what's going to be done to frame them in um, so that they look like they belong there and not like they've been stuck on a wall like a piece of art. Not or another Band-Aid solution for yeah, the problem. Yeah. Um, and just to note on the, the trellis, the staff's concern with the trellis is primarily that it's forward of where we would allow um, a fence or a, a landscape structure of that sort. So um, the design of it is is perfectly appropriate and typical for what we see people install for fencing and that sort of thing. Um, I think it exceeds the height allowance and then it's it's forward of the setback that we would typically require for, for fencing or other structures of that type. Okay, it is, um, it is six feet back and I am, uh, if, needed, I can take one or two, I could take some of the boards down to reduce the height. Um, the, I was going to take some down and take a picture of it and put them back up, but um, the screws, they cannot be put back up. So once they come down, that's it. They can't, uh, can't be screwed in again. So, um, so. I, I would just, on the, on the trellis, I would say they are not approvable. 
They're not trellises under our definition. They're not in the location that we allow trellises. And basically they are just fences. It's just, it's a fence panel. I, I don't think there's any, I don't see anything in the guidelines that would let us approve what you're calling the trellises. I, under, I think we all understand your intent, but I, I just don't think that there is anything in the guidelines that would allow us to even give you an exception for those panels. That would be my opinion on the panels. And um, I, I hate, well, I guess I'll, I'll let you respond. I, I, on, that, yeah, on that side, I also included this sheet that's, but you can see on this side, that's where my children's bedroom is. Right. I, and there are four trucks that park right. There and, and you explained that last time. I, I'm totally sympathetic to the to situations that we wish we could, uh, you know, make, uh, you know, something happen that would maybe alleviate that. But in this situation, I just don't believe that that. Uh, I mean, as the commission, we have to be able to vote on something that's in our guidelines, and or have an exception. And and that kind of exception is really not is not generally what we uh, make exceptions for. Uh, you bought the house and you can see how close the house is to driveways. I mean, almost every house in the historic neighborhood, or half of them, are very close and have cars, parking. I mean, I've lived in one where you could probably reach your hand out and touch the car that's in the driveway. I mean, it's just a part of the, it's just the nature of the closeness in historic, in some parts of the historic district. So uh, I understand that. I just, I just don't see any way or any way in the guidelines that we could do that, that, that portion of the uh, application. Well, okay, and I did, oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, I, and I wanted to back up to the, the painting. So I hate cases like these because we're talking about after the fact, what to do and how to do it. Um, but I agree with, with um, Commissioner Meacham that the, these, are, these are fences and it's their location that's the issue. Um, but then the painting, the painting clearly doesn't meet the guidelines either. Um, and the intent of the guidelines is that you drive through new neighborhoods right now and every single house is white, painted white. I think your house looks nice. Um, but the concern here is the uh, go forward and ask for forgiveness later approach. What, what do we see? How does that start to unravel um, down the line? So I'm not sure I feel comfortable with those two items uh, approving anything today without some additional information. I mean, I would, I did. Um, I would add to the page that to me, unfortunately, what, what you've described is you had a problem with the brick, and it was, it, it was a, 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 you know, from your description, it was a large area of brick that was bulging. And so... And, and pests living and inside. An entire family of birds right, nesting. Right, there. And so generally, though, the solution would be to remove the brick to a certain point where the brick is stable, and then put brick back. Now we've dealt with that many times. Sometimes it is harder than other times to find brick that's the same or to reuse brick. But if that would have been done, you would have only had a portion of your brick on the back would have been repaired. Uh, and so by not repairing the brick, you actually then went to the larger solution of then covering all of the brick up with a different color of paint. So. I mean, that, that problem really rests on, you know, not repairing the brick. The color, the only, only I mean, I've, I have sympathy for this too, but uh, I mean, even if the brick wouldn't have matched on the back and you would have, because I always think, how, what would you do if you came to us? We could have said, well, you know, you say, I can't find any brick that matches. It looks terrible. Well, maybe we could paint the back of the house the same color as the brick and we would have solved the problem. But now we've just got a whole house with, I understand, a bark-like texture on the brick 
that is not, it's not able to remove the brick. I don't know if anybody on the commission would be interested in painting the house, the brick color. I don't know. There's not a lot of, um, it's a tough one. Well, yeah, I kind of agree. And I got a, a couple thoughts on really a lot of these items. It kind of sounds like, um, personally, sounds like there's a little bit of a consensus, you know, with the paint specifically. I mean, this is why painted brick is such a kind of a key issue because it's really not easily reversible without, um, you know, if you're like sandblast, you're going to damage the brick. There's just no good way to reverse it. So, of course, the best approach is not to paint in the first place. And I don't, this is maybe a question um, to legal counsel or to Katie, but I don't know if there's a way, I don't know if there's a, uh, a realistic way to reverse the painted brick. So there's a question of, is there a way that we can officially almost like cite, you know, that this is not approved, but I don't know. I mean, it's, I, we it's, would normally deny it, of course, but I don't know what that means. I would really. call it, I would call it in this circumstance, perhaps mitigation, that we're trying to mitigate the result and this could possibly be a way to do it. I don't know. So maybe there's some language in the... I would well, I was I about just our... humbly suggest that um, when someone is sitting down with the paperwork at the title company and they've got, they're making one of the biggest decisions in their life, just having a small box that you check saying, I'm moving into his, a historic society uh, area, that is not enough on a day when you're making one of the most important decisions to understand, I mean, I have lived in a historic area, but this is a completely different type of historic area. Um, so Ms. Crawford? Hi. Yes. And I, I am totally sympathetic with you, but I will say that on the Oklahoma Standard Real Estate contract, it does say you're moving into a historic neighborhood, and the check is on the real estate contract. Yes, ma'am. That's saying, what I'm saying that I did. A little bit more. It, well, um, I think you're saying it tight at the title. But I think if there was a because it is so important, and this is, could potentially be thousands and thousands of dollars, not to mention the stress over a period of a year. This has been going on for me since July. Every time I have to work on this or come before you, I'm taking a vacation day. I have very few vacation days. Um, so I think more needs to be done than that box. That's not enough to say to a homeowner, hey, we have conditions if you want to move here, you cannot paint your house. You cannot take out windows. You know, you, you are not, you don't control your property. These r rules and regulations control your property. People need to know, I mean, whether it's, for hopefully a, a purse, a representative could go to these closings so people would know or the perhaps The issue is it's with the Oklahoma Metropolitan Association of Realtors. It did used to be a more thorough explanation and it has been greatly diminished in the past few years, but unfortunately that is completely beyond the bounds of anything this commission can control. I don't disagree with you at all. I am a realtor and I live in one of these neighborhoods and it still confuses me all of the time. But it is, um, I think that's a really great amount of feedback for Oakmar but there's nothing that this commission can do about it. I completely agree with you. I think it's, um, I think it's really risky to not be clearer about that, and I think it's very unfair not to lay that out in as plain and bold of terms as possible, but it has nothing to do with anything this commission can control. I will note that we have, staff has worked with the Realtor Association to do workshops for realtors to educate realtors better on the rules so that it's their, you know, selling homes, they can educate their buyers about what it means to be in a historic district. And the other thing we always tell everybody is it, it's, it's your zoning. It's not um, some neighborhood association thing that's hidden away somewhere. It's the actual legal zoning of the property by the city of Oklahoma City. And whether you're buying commercial property or a historic property or any other type of property, you know, we hope that people are paying attention to what their zoning is and what's allowed for the property that they're buying. Um, but I completely understand the, the frustration and feeling like that wasn't made clear to you. Um, I wanted to on follow- that, On that day, you're making a tremendous tra financial transaction. Yeah. So just checking the box, it's, that is, you cannot give yourself 
that full attention on yeah. that day when you're signing all of those papers. Trust me, everybody I, yeah. up here wishes that it were like three full sheets in bright red. I mean, we, we absolutely understand where you're coming from. It's just completely beyond the scope of anything that we could regulate. Okay, and on so finding, um, but then I bought the house and I, I wasn't able to move here because I'm a single mom and I had three kids that I was taking care of in Dallas. So I just turned over solving these problems to the contractor. I did look in the neighborhood. This is right on the next block. It's exactly the same as mine. Um, there's also another uh, trellis, two houses down from mine that's exactly the same, right in front of the window. Um, on, uh, I uh, drove past or rode my bike past 15th and Lee every day. There are two completely painted brick houses yeah, I'm, I'm sorry just, to interject, but that's something that we can't really consider. Okay, you know, I'm just saying look that at everything I on a case tried to do basis. things that were yeah. already in existence. This sure. one, which is on page seven, yeah. is no different than mine. No, I appreciate that, but we can't consider that as part of this uh, individual hearing or case. Okay. What, Katie, what happens when work has already been done and can't be undone like, like this? What happens? Well, on the discussion about um, a... Uh, a motion to approve work that we that the commission doesn't feel is appropriate. I, I was going to say that we have similar language that we use when we approve a demolition, where the demolition is not appropriate in the sense of the structure being historic, but the demolition is necessary because of the condition of the structure. So I, I think that the if the decision is to approve the painting, a motion could be crafted to suggest that while this is not appropriate, we are approving it on the basis that it cannot be mitigated without causing further damage to the brick. Um, I don't know if the commission's in a position to make that motion yeah. today or if you all feel like you still wanna see more information about removal of the paint, but I think that's the kind of language you would want to use. It, seem, it seems maybe a little bit, um, you know, from what I'm hearing from the commission that, you know, the, the painted brick is a little bit what it is and as Katie just mentioned, maybe there's some kind of language you can craft in the motion. It sounds like the screens and the, you know, the trellis fence um, elements are not really approved by the guidelines. There's no real path. There's no real specific condition. So it sounds like that's something that um, is pretty clear cut maybe. And then as far as the openings, the windows, it sounds like um, there's a path to get that done, but um, perhaps a a better option would be to just use an approved window, you know, that we have door from the guidelines, um, you know, whether it's a uh, aluminum clad wood or, or. I think, what, I think what she's saying is that she's unable to put a window in there because the plumbing is so close that the, there's an opening would not allow it. Is that correct? Okay, is that, so that like the toilet is up against the wall or something? I think, well, I think she was proposing a faux window. So it, wouldn't, oh, okay. it would just. No, I don't even know that if I can the... use any hardware. I think it will have to be glued up there because the way that the house was remodeled, all that there is is the drywall and the plumbing. Or at, mm -hmm. in the on the other side, it abuts the um, tile. Where exactly is that located? That's on the side, kind of in the back. Sorry, yes. The back. And I mean, and that was something that was completed someone had you know improved the house before you purchased it is that correct and then or somebody, this is some work that somebody um, flipped the house yeah well i think at a minimum before um before approving or denying this project oh, i think we would have to go. see some specifics regarding the the windows and the doors and how those would be adhered and what staff was comfortable with um considering i mean you know, that is a staff question, whether they're comfortable with stained glass or clear glass or whatever else. Um, but I, I don't know how we could move it any direction but as a continuance without clarity on that. I agree. It would be nice if we were to continue it one more time, um, which I'm sorry because I know that you're taking time off work and um, I'm not I sure that we have. I have to use my vacation to come. Yeah, I, yeah, I know we that we, to. I don't know if we have the information to approve or deny, or, but um, I do have one other piece of evidence to present for the, the trellis. Let's say we take all of the... I, I, I appreciate that, but I, I, I really feel like that 
the trail, I feel like that what I'm hearing from fellow commissioners is the trellises are not going to be allowed. You're going to have to remove them because they're okay. not going to be approved. So I, I can take the wood off and um, I already have Whatever you leave will still have to be approved. So if you want to take the wood off and come back on another application perhaps, I, you, you need to talk to staff. They're going to know. And it, it's, I, and I, I know that you, you want to call it a trellis, but it really falls under the fence guidelines. So if you can make it fall under the fence guidelines, you know, that would be one thing. But it's not going to fall under the trellis guidelines because it's not a trellis. Okay, but I could remove the wood and put this up, which is 75% see through. I, you're going to have to work with staff and, and call it, in my opinion, a, a fence. And if, if you can make it work as a fence, then that we have certain guidelines for that. It may have to be a different kind of material, or Katie, could it not be like a, see, a metal see through fence? So um, the guideline, we could administratively approve a fence that is. Uh, transparent and that is no more than six feet tall and that sits back six feet from the front wall of the house and then any landscaping that you want to do in addition to that we wouldn't review so if the fence structure itself meets those transparency requirements then you could provide that additional screening that you're trying to get with uh, with the landscaping okay so and we can administratively approve that if we can get it to where it meets those right. guidelines I, without it having to come back to the Commission and, and I would like to speak in, in, in kind of in favor of the openings <laughs> in that um, the, the, this issue was not um, created by the current owner. Uh, I feel like that, yes, there are things that could be done, but they're all going to result in a basically a fake window. Mm -hmm. It's never going to be a real window. It's never going to look like a real window. I don't think that the door or the other, the things you've proposed, which I appreciate you looking, I don't think those are going to help. In my opinion, this, the openings at this point should perhaps come under the brick paint yeah, rule I because uh, I think that looks, at least to me, it's kind of a neutral solution mm -hmm. to the situation. And uh, there's too many, of, if it was just one or two that was facing the street, then maybe we could try to work out something. But I feel like that there's just so many of them and they're all facing the street. I don't know if there's any on the back, but that would be my suggestion, would be to, to roll up the, the paint and the openings into one. I agree with that because, you know, you, it's not realistic to remodel the interior, you know, again. Um, it's just not, not realistic. I mean, if you would have uh, done it, maybe. <laughs> Since right. you really didn't do it, and you were really kind of forced so, to create a solution. I mean, if you would have come to us and said, what can I do because I moved here and I have this problem, I, I, you know, I'm not really sure what we would have suggested, but I don't think this is the worst solution. So, I mean, I would be willing to make a proposal to um, approve the brick and the openings as a, as Katie indicated, a... I don't know, unfortunate situation. So here, I, Rita and I have been passing notes. Oh, okay. Um, so what I, I think is similar to the demolition language is um, to approve with the specific findings that the proposed work will have an adverse effect on the historic character of the property or district, but is necessary due to the previous painting of the brick and infill of the windows uh, that cannot be removed without damaging the brick or further damaging the openings. I would agree so, with that. And I would like that to be included in my motion to approve those two <laughs> items. Well, so I, I think the question for you comes down to it. It sounds like the commission has kind of talked through it and, and come to a consensus on those items. The question for you and for, uh, uh, for Katie is on the fence. If we continue the fence, can she make modifications under this current application for staff approval and come in and meet Katie versus a denial and then you have to do the application fee again Yes, so there's one continuance remaining. We could continue it to the June 1st meeting, and that gives the applicant a full two months to work with staff toward an administratively approvable solution to the, the trellis fence 
So structure. you wouldn't have to come back to the commission again if it could work out. You don't want to see me again. <laughs> well, we don't want you to use another vacation day. And uh, so if you could work with them to get a, a, a fence that was staff, could be administrated by staff, then you'd be done. Right. Well, that, does that sound like a way to go? Yes, that does. Thank you, Commissioner okay. Rachel. Okay, before I move to a motion, are there any other citizens who want to be heard on this item? I'm sorry. Sounds like we have a clear direction. We have a motion. Okay. Oh, uh, oh I'm sorry. Angela, would you like to speak? Um, I just wanted to note, in case you didn't notice, that the window locations that have been closed are, in fact, located in the non-historic portion of the house. It's an old portion of the house, but it is an addition to the house. And so these closures are somewhat unique and that they're not occurring within the boundaries of the historic house itself. Angela, I'm sure that is noted in this report. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that was noted. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, are you ready for a motion? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, I make a motion to, uh, for HPCA 21-00174 items one and three. I'm gonna let Katie help me with the language here. Uh, if Rita has no objection, can we just put to insert into the record what, what staff suggested? Yes. That, do you need us to read it back out loud? Or? Yes, uh, that would be perfect. That would be fine to do, that you just have to express it for purposes okay. of the record. Okay. So it does have to be read. You can okay. read it and you what? can adopt it as your motion. Okay. Okay. I'll read that one more time. So Commissioner Meacham is, mo is making a motion to approve items one and three with the specific findings that the proposed work will have an adverse effect on the historic character of the property or district, but is necessary due to the previous painting of the brick and enclosure of the window and door openings that cannot be removed without further damaging the brick or the openings. Is that your motion? Yes, that is my motion. Okay, we got a motion by Commissioner Meacham. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right, we have a second from Commissioner um, Corbin. Sorry. <laughs> Please vote in prime go. And that motion passes. And I just want to say I completely, oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna make a motion. Oh, the continuance, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I would also uh, like to make a motion to uh, continue item two to the in second. Uh, June 1st. June 1st meeting uh, for HBCA 21-00174. All right, motion by Commissioner Meacham. Do we have a second? I'll second that motion. All right. Second from Commissioner Poor. Please vote in prime vote. <clears throat> All right, that motion passes. So um, hopefully you can work that out with staff before that hearing day. And I agree with you on um, the notice regarding the HP districts. Um, that should be something that is clear the first time you visit a house, you know, that you're considering purchasing. So um, I sympathize with you on that as well. And but. perhaps like a simple recording that you just email out so that somebody really absorbs it. Um, the link to the YouTube would be channel. helpful. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I appreciate it, and uh, we are moving on to item three, HPCA 21-00180. This is at, for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This is at 401 Northwest 14th Street, Heritage Hills, Ward 6, consideration of possible action on application by Connie Scothorn, CLS, and Associates 
for Dan Morris for certificate of appropriateness. I'm not going to read all the items off. The commission has seen this twice now, so this is the third hearing, but this is a number of different landscape and paving um, projects to the property, including driveway removal, installation of patios, outdoor kitchen, swimming pool, and um, in-ground uh, trampoline, as well as proposed fencing. You'd have uh, quite a hefty little stack of letters of support at uh, each of the commission members' seats and uh, more detailed comments from the Neighborhood Association describing the work that they've engaged in with the applicant, um, changes that have been made to the project that the neighborhood um, felt were beneficial um, and identifying issues that they felt were pertinent for the commission to consider. All right, thank you, Katie. Good afternoon, could you uh, state your name and address, please? Dan Morris, 401 Northwest 14th Street. All right. And um, so we've heard this a couple times. Are there any questions on the submittal from the commissioners? I just have a comment because, as Katie said, we received a lot of letters in support and um, as well as kind of an amended letter from um, HPI, you know, stating that everybody worked together and all of that. I just want to thank everybody involved for communicating and getting on the same page. I know it's, you know, can be endlessly frustrating to have neighbors against a project and inserting themselves, but um, we try to really value that coming from the neighborhoods and especially with HPI as they have been so instrumental in creating the Historic Preservation Commission and these um, different neighborhoods within the city. You know, um, I know I personally try to listen to that feedback as well, but it seems like everybody's worked together and everybody seems on the same page with it. So I just nice. wanted to comment yeah. because I was, you know, so adamant that we needed to work with the neighborhood. So I just yeah, wanted I mean, to comment that I appreciate that. I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, thanks. And, and happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, oh. Thanks for being here. I, I agree and I appreciate it. I, I'm, my comments were, I think, mainly that I needed more information in the form of drawings. And I feel like that the drawings are totally sufficient now. So. Good job. Yeah, it sounds like there's been a lot of positive dialogue and staff is recommending approval. and. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't have any other comments. Um, any other commissioners have any comments? Anyone from the public want to speak on this item? Who didn't already send in one of these? Yeah. Hello. Um, do we have a motion? I'm happy to make a motion. I need to look and see um, exactly how staff phrased it. And there are a lot of items too. So. Uh, no. <laughs> um, trying to remember there, um, which items we're actually even dealing with today. Is it? Did we end up approving any of them, or is it one through seventeen? So everything is remaining. Everything is recommended for approval. Um, there are no conditions associated with any of the recommendations. There are some unique circumstances uh, identified in the staff report. But I believe because there's no conditions and everything is approval, not continue or deny, you could motion to approve all items with the specific findings as list and unique circumstances as listed in the staff report. And we can group it all together. Okay. Um, I motion to approve HPCA 21-00180, um, approval of all items with stated conditions in the staff report. All right. Moved by Commissioner Jordan. I'll second. Um, just to clarify, with the findings and unique circumstances, right? With the findings okay. and unique cir circumstances. Okay, appreciate it. Do we have a, uh, did someone second? And then, okay, second by Commissioner Corbin. Uh, please vote in prime growth. All right, and you are approved. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, item four, HPCA 21-00192. This is located at 2301 Northwest 26th Street, Shepherd Ward 2. Consideration of possible action on application by John Reinke, Living Spaces LLC, for Carol Reinke, for certificate of appropriateness to item two, replace garage. This application was uh, presented previously to the commission and continued with a request that some changes be made to the proposed garage. The applicant has revised the design um, it meets all relevant guidelines for the, the form and the size of the garage. 
um, and in general meets guidelines for all of the materials. Staff did recommend a, um, approval with condition that some of the uh, pedestrian and garage door materials be addressed um, and some of the drawings clarified to note where certain items were located. And you can see that on pages 10 and 11 of the staff report. And I'm, I'm assuming the applicant's probably ready to address those as well. Yep. Because he's ready always prepared. <laughs> John Reinke here to address, oh, we want that picture right there. So um, here, so John Reinke is my name and I'm here to address this project. So I'm here with the owner, Les. All right, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, it sounds like staff is recommending approval and it sounds like you've made a lot of um, changes and adjustments um, and address yeah. concerns. Are there any If you remember what the last plan was, this is nothing nearly so dramatic. So, uh, so it definitely fits more in line with the more modest nature of the buildings that we see in the secondary structures in the neighborhood. So um, yeah, I think pretty much where we're at is just need to address the specific uh, the specific considerations that the staff had listed. So what, John, can, are you in agreement with the conditions? And for the most part, and the only one, and just in order, number one is revise the elevation and so that the door on the north wall actually shows that it breaks the stem wall and that's absolutely okay. Adding mini split on the north wall, you know, just to show it in, show it is definitely something we can and will do and get those submitted ASAP. And number three, and the staff consider, the thing is to relocate the utility doors further to the east and we have no issue with doing so. You can see them here and we're doing something very similar, but in the plan we had moved that double door closer to the dividing wall between the garage and the apartment structure. And so really, if you guys have a minimum distance that you'd like it to be relocated, I can adjust the drawings to reflect that. We are not married to it being in that last two feet of the actual garage space. Was there a reason for that, Katie? If I'm, I think I can address that okay. in my conversations with staff. Essentially, it was and that it uh, made it a little bit unbalanced. So you had a blank wall to the east and uh, a lot going on on the west. So from a structure, from an architectural perspective, it just looked really busy on one side. And then uh, I think that's pretty much what it was. So you know. And so we could center it in the garage space, you know, and that would be acceptable to us because we could do storage on both sides and that would be fine. So, and so if that is acceptable to the staff, then I'll just make a note that we want to center those doors in the garage space, which would push them further to the west by probably about three or four feet. So right now it's about a two and a half to three foot distance, so that would add another, so it'd be a total of about six feet, six to seven feet between the doors, between the edges of the doors. And, and, and I would just say yes, I would say that's an accurate description of the concern. Sorry, I was trying to find that spot on the drawings, okay. just to have it be more balanced on that yeah. side of the garage and not windows and doors all clustered at one end and then a large expanse of blank wall. Um, I just have a question regarding the materials only because it's going to require an approval with unique circumstances. Um, any reason for the steel door? Actually, uh, we can address that next. Okay. I'm uh, but to answer your question, we don't actually need a steel door there. It's a steel door now. Uh, okay. The utility doors are, you know, but we are okay with using wood doors in that place. So as far as that particular one goes, it doesn't really matter. The door on the north, uh, however, which is completely concealed behind the privacy fence and there that faces west and then the privacy fence that faces north. And then of course we have you know, the backyard uh, that borders us to the west. Sorry, I, I mentioned the fence facing west, but that's facing east. And so the, the, till the proposed, see in this mock-up, in this photograph right here, that's essentially where we would want to put a door. And uh, so once we've actually you know, addressed the grading and made this 
little alley area usable for the property, having access to it from the garage would be great. But because it is so sheltered, both from the house and from all visible angles, we definitely want to use a steel door in that location just for the security of the building. Okay. So, um, and it is completely sheltered from view. So from the historical, you know, fabric of the community, that really should be okay. So if you guys are all right with that, that's what we're gonna do there. Okay, thank you for the clarity. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I can make the note and, you know, are we okay with me moving the utility doors on the south side to the middle point of the garage structure? So it's about, so it'd be, the garage itself is about 22 feet deep. Uh, if I remember correctly, so that would move it to be about 11 feet from the front corner and 11 feet from the back corner of the actual garage portion of that. And I don't know if we need to give you a specific like measurement there, but you can work with staff. And I'm sorry, say again? I don't think we need to give you a specific measurement, but it sounds like the intent is clear, so I think you could work with staff to kind of figure out. Yeah, I don't think that the motion has to include a... Yeah. A measurement. I think they yeah, can just say I, to, to recenter those utility doors. Is, not surprised is fine. to hear you guys yeah. say that. <laughs> so okay, but that's that's good. We're all we are all in accord there, and then um, points number five and six are both talking about the utility about the materials uh, and special considerations, which, as we just discussed, is really not an issue because we're so going to use wood. Yeah, to be clear on that, you said um, it sounds like you know that that steel door on the non-visible side come to back. Yep. You know, I don't have an issue with that. And right. you're open to adjusting the materials on the other yep. openings. Okay. So um, then the only other point that um, really needs to be discussed probably, and let's we'll go ahead and skip one to number eight. It is going to be clear glass on the door that wasn't immediately apparent from the drawings. So our visual panels on the garage door itself are intended to be clear glass. So that is definitely something we're going to do. So then coming back to number seven, uh, the location of the overhead door on the east face. There we go. So, and this is an excellent picture because you can clearly see uh, we've got this recessed area that is on the north side of the driveway. And on the south side of the driveway, we've got this old growth pecan tree. And uh, we aren't interested in changing the paving here for both of those considerations. We want to retain the recessed area on the north and we obviously don't want to cut down this tree on the south. And really we're using the same, the corner of the garage as it exists right now, right here on the southeast corner. Is that right? Yeah, southeast corner. That really is the point of uh, beginning for the new structure so we're really just expanding it five feet to the south side and I've got an excellent picture of the tree in full growth if you guys are interested in seeing that and um, that really kind of shows what this is going to look like and uh, as things are developed but basically with the consideration of those two fixed points we really can't create a new driveway so the off-center thing while it is a little unusual. It definitely is the way that this achieves its functional, its be, its functional best. So we want to keep the double door, and we want to keep it off center. Any comments regarding the door? So just to be clear, regarding that door, under the condition. Um, that is a condition, so I guess if someone's going to make a motion on that condition, um, we'd have to address that. I will. Uh, I'll go ahead and make a motion. Okay. Uh, I make a motion to approve HPCA 2100192 with the specific finding as, as noted by the staff in the staff report and the following conditions. Uh, condition one, uh, there's no change there. Yeah, we correct? will revise that. Okay. Uh, uh, two, uh, same condition as noted in the staff report. Uh, three, same condition as noted in the staff report. Um, number four, let's see, the, those utility doors to be wood. 
Is that correct, John? Yes, ma'am. Uh, oh, five, to approve one steel door on the north side with a unique circumstance of uh, location and security. To approve uh, number six, that's, well, that's number six. Okay. Yeah, five, six, five and six are both Sa the same, the basically. Same. Uh, number seven, that the overhead door, which is the garage door, correct? Correct. Uh, will be in, will be constructed as shown on the plans with a unique circumstance of using the existing driveway and of saving uh, an existing uh, tree. And eight, no changes. No changes. All right, thank you. Uh, motion made by Commissioner Meacham. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right, we've got a second by Commissioner Remy. All in favor, please vote. All right, and that passes. Appreciate it, John. Great, thanks. See you next month for a really unique project. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. All right, we are on to item five, HPCA 2200016. This is located at 717 Northwest 27th Street, Paseo, Ward 2, consideration and possible action on application by Quinn Roberts for certificate of appropriateness to one, construct addition required, two, construct deck required, three, replace windows required, four, install patio doors elective, and five, install fence required. And this is work that has um, either been initiated or completed already that the commission will review as if it had not yet occurred. Um, the proposed deck and fence uh, meet applicable guidelines for administrative approval. They're just included to have it all in one nice neat package if possible. Um, staff did recommend continuance for the proposed window and door replacement. Um, we felt that we needed better documentation of both the proposed work to be done and the previously existing conditions, uh, materials, um, size of openings, et cetera. Um, staff recommended continuance of the addition uh, to verify and confirm that the proposed siding was the appropriate match for the um, historic siding that is on the structure. Staff also noted that the addition is not differentiated from the historic structure in any way. Um, other than just the change uh, in the siding material. However, it's a very small addition, so typical methods of differentiation may not be feasible for such a small addition. Um, so those items were recommended for continuance. The deck and the fence were recommended for approval. All right, thank you, Katie. Good afternoon, could you state your name and address, please? Yes, Quinn Roberts, 717 Northwest 27. All right, I appreciate it. Do we have any comments um, from the commissioners? Sounds like, sounds like a pretty minor addition and it seems like uh, besides some additional documentation, maybe there weren't any major concerns, but I'll see if I have any other comments from our commissioners. Fellow commissioners. Katie, are there some items that you're recommending? We recommended approval of the proposed fence and the deck, and then we recommended um, continuance for the other items. So, did there need to be changes to the existing windows in the, in the addition? Are they not correct? So, some windows were replaced within the historic structure. Um, there were some aluminum windows that were likely not original. Um, it was not clear if all of the openings, what the original size of the openings were and whether the window replacements fit the existing openings. Um, and then there were patio doors proposed that I believe the material of the doors was not defined, um, although they were described as matching um, previously existing doors. How many windows are we talking about um, for being, how many windows are being replaced? I believe it was eight. Okay, so eight windows that are on, that are not a part of the addition, correct? 
Yes. Okay. And is it just two that are on the front of the house? Sorry. There's two. Front so of the both of the windows on the front of the house. Correct? Yes. Okay. And it sounds like those were not the historic windows to begin with. Is that correct? They were. Well, the, the windows were added in accordance to the material I was reading that were allowable as wood windows with aluminum clad. Okay. And so, so that's what I went with. Okay, perfect. So the new windows are, are per the guidelines and the ones you replaced weren't, it sounds like they weren't original anyways. So that sounds like it would have been something that we would have probably approved. Um, so, it, Katie, and I'm, I apologize if I missed this, but exactly why are we recommending um, continuing the windows? I understand the patio doors, but why exactly the windows? Uh, sorry, my, so if you look at the photos, it looks like at least some of them have changed the size of the opening from what okay. the historic opening was. Okay. You can see where that it's been filled in around the siding. Um, now that's something that the commission has the discretion to, to approve, but we wanted to call your attention to that and to make sure that that was um, adequately recorded and documented as a change to the structure. Okay. I do appreciate that you didn't just fill in windows like, uh, you know, you, you replaced the windows where there were windows with a, you know, approvable window um, from the guidelines. So. I do have an answer for that though. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the replaceable windows that I did, I, uh, they're in correspondence with the actual size of the window I took out. Okay. The window I took out was in a frame, a box, and I measured the box frame. So we went back with the exact size of the box frame. You didn't reframe any openings? The, no, the um, middle window on the west, uh, east side, right there. Mm -hmm. I did that when I got the notice to stop. Oh. It was open, I closed it back up. Uh, that is not going to be there. <laughs> so actually that window, that's kind of like a temporary window. That's a temporary okay. deal. Uh, I was experimenting before I knew I had to go in front of the board. Sure. Uh, I was experimenting with uh, changing the size of the window. I didn't understand how this works. So just to make sure uh, that, that, that that window is in the bathtub. Okay. Yeah. And, and I know it's historical, but it's a terrible place for that window. <laughs> it is, but it we, we generally don't let people change the size of the bathroom window. I understand. That I was just explaining sense, my yeah, 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 we thought that that's probably Yeah, it was just a, a terrible place for it. it right. Dry rot was ridiculous, and, and the complaints were ridiculous. Uh, but that is a temporary. So temporary. it sounds like maybe that's something we could add a condition to replace that window with, a, with an approvable window uh, that fits that original opening. Yes, I, I stopped work as soon as I got the notice, so. Yeah. Is that something you're open to if we approve it? I'm fine it? with that. Okay. I'm um, fine with that. And then regarding the patio doors, which I think were the other things that we were looking for clarity on, um, do you have anything to add there that could move us forward a little bit more? Uh, we, we put that there according to the addition of the bathroom that we added. Uh, and we were gonna add a decking to come off the back. Mm -hmm. And because it was in the rear of the home, um, we went with that style of door. Okay, and Katie, is it just that we're, and I'm sorry, I'm scrolling through here looking for what staff was asking for. Is it just that we are looking for clarity of material? Okay, um, additional information is required from the applicant to, continue, to uh, approve the patio doors. Yeah, I believe they were just not fully described. So we didn't know if it was a product that met the guidelines or not, basically. What, what meets the guidelines? So um, on the back of the house, doors can be uh, wood, aluminum clad wood. I believe we've approved uh, fiberglass products before. Um, Does, did yours fall into any of those categories? Uh, I believe it to be fiberglass, but I need to check it. <laughs> so those are, um, I think that's something that we could, uh, that could be approved with a condition that the documentation be provided to staff and um, that, that either the doors meet guidelines for approval or that a revised door that meets the guidelines be submitted to staff. I think that's something that we can work through with the applicant if, if he's amenable to that. Okay, so we would do um, an approval with conditions. Okay, um, well if, if everybody else is comfortable, I'll make a motion to approve. Yeah, I'll uh, ask for public comment real quick. Oh, uh, sorry. But is there anyone else who wants to speak on this item? No. Okay, go Okay, um, I move to approve HPCA 22-00016 uh, with 
the agreed upon conditions. All right, I mean, motion I, made by Commissioner Jordan. Sorry. I, uh, there was also addressing the uh, society. Okay, we need to have a condition. We do need to have a condition. Yeah, we, we need, need to have, to have a condition have that, that, um, that there would be a, a final submittal of windows, window, uh, wind, uh, description of windows, window locations, uh, door uh, material, and you know size to be submitted to staff. Okay. To be included. So that would be your doors and windows. So you would need to have all of your documentation for your doors and windows submitted to staff yes. to match what you've done or what you're going to do, and to make sure that your your doors are either approvable or you'd have to go get a different door for the sliding door. Yes. To see, okay. But that's the, those are the stated conditions, correct? Yes, for the doors and windows, yeah. It's, it just needs to add to the, to the, the finding, to, to a condition on both the doors and windows that staff needs to, all, all documentation needs to be submitted to staff for approval. Right. Yep, that's what we typically say. Now, the, the one other thing that's noted in the staff report is that the siding material is not what we typically um, support in the guidelines. It's a wood grain finish, and the guidelines say that siding should use a smooth finish. Um, we did note that it may be the best match for the siding that's on the existing structure, but we wanted to make sure the commission was aware of that and noted that in the staff report um, before we approved the addition. We just want to address that specific finding and say, yeah. Yeah, I'm personally comfortable with it, but if anybody else has um, commentary. We just want to add that to the should motion I, or? So should I amend that motion or make it? Maybe just make note of that? So, um, yeah, I think it could just be an additional finding that the siding as proposed is the most appropriate match okay. for the okay. existing. So uh, with the additional finding that the proposed siding is the best match. As proposed. As proposed. Awesome. Okay, so motion by Commissioner Jordan. Do we have a second? I'll second that motion. All right, second by Commissioner Poor. Please vote in prime gov. All right, you are approved. Thank so you I very guess much. Just, uh, Thank yeah, you. get with staff and you can get your CA approved. Thank you. All right, moving on to item six, HPCA 2020-00017. This is at 500 Northwest 16th Street, Mesta Park, Ward 6. Consideration of possible action on application by Holly Hunt, Sam Gresham Architecture, for Darla O'Neill for certificate of appropriateness to two construct an addition elective Three, construct porch at addition elective. Four, replace wood fence with stucco fence elective. Five, relocate mechanical equipment elective. Seven, replace fence and retaining wall on west elective. And nine, install fencing elective. The commission heard this application last month and approved a couple of items related to the garage and the driveway, but continued these items. There was discussion about uh, modifications to the proposed addition to um, respond to some comments about the proportions, the height, finished floor height and height of the roof, et cetera. Um, and the applicant has submitted some revisions to respond to those comments. There was also discussion about the location and the height and the material of the fencing. Um, the applicant has still proposed the eight foot fencing, although there is a, an alternate for a six foot fence detail in your packet uh, that they provided. The other thing that, um, Staff wanted to note is that the fencing on the west side of the property comes all the way to the front of the house and meets an existing fence um, that the applicant doesn't intend to remove or replace. So it would be coming forward of where we would typically allow the fencing to be installed, but that's to meet an existing fence that is intended to be retained. Um, and then that the fence on the east side is um, stucco, which is not is neither specifically allowed for in the guidelines, nor is it prohibited. We do allow for masonry fence walls, um, but we just noted that there's not stucco present elsewhere on the property. So um, something for the commission to consider. Um, but I believe we did recommend approval with conditions. Um, 
just that if there were any further changes to um, design details that those be submitted to staff. Um, there are some products that we didn't have product material for. We have drawings of windows, but not like a, you know, Colby, Marvin, Pella, whatever specification sheet for windows, those types of things. Um, and then that uh, the fence be not exceed six feet in height as allowed by the guidelines. All right, thank you, Katie. Good afternoon, could you say your name and address? Holly Hunt, uh, 400 Northwest 23rd Street with Sam Gresham Architects. Um, it is so nice to see so many friendly faces again. <laughs> We're all together again. Um, so yeah, last meeting, we had a, a good discussion, albeit rushed, because we, uh, uh, anyway, uh, felt like we got really close. So, uh, but based on that discussion, I've brought forth some revisions to help, uh, you know, ease or appease the concerns of both the staff and the commissioners discussion we had. Uh, I feel like this addition is super compatible, not only within the guidelines as the staff report uh, reflects, but um, but also, you know, being that it's a secondary structure, we did frame it slightly different. Um, as you know, we have lowered that finished floor as you go into the backyard, and, and you'll see that in the staff report, them talking about that ceiling height differentiation between the first floor um, of the existing and the proposed. But I just wanted to note that the whole idea here is that the ceiling is the same, you know, that we're just stepping down into the backyard. So I uh, wanted that to be super clear. Um, but other than that, uh, um, I, I, I feel like um, we're really thrilled with the um, recommendation for approval, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, the specific, I'd like us, you know, if anything, like if we have any issue with the addition, uh, let's discuss those first, and then I would like us to maybe focus at the end on that eight-foot stucco fence that seems to be the point of concern in the staff report. So, well, I was going to start off by saying, you know, staff is recommending recommending approval. I was going to ask uh, if you were in agreement with the staff findings on the fence, but uh, we can we can put that on the end, I guess, if we want to discuss the fence more. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't have any issues with it. Um, I guess, could you just maybe clarify one thing on the addition on the back, kind of that back patio and those, um, you know, that's kind of a tall um, column. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So I, I, I have made some notes um, as I was reading through. And if you'll refer to A3.3, I actually give you a dimension on that front porch column. It's 10 foot 10 from grade to the top of the column. So then you could refer again to A5.2. The column detail shows the column in the rear is 10 foot 11. There is a one inch difference between these columns. I find them to be quite compatible. It's just kind of where that eave landed uh, on the plate. It's slightly off by an inch. Um, but I would point out too that you know we've reduced, we've matched proportions vertically, but we have reduced the thickness of that column as a way too to make it secondary. It's in the rear, but I just wanted to point that out. The height is very similar. Sure, I think the I think the one thing that kind of makes it maybe look a little bit odd is um, because of that floor change. Sure. You know where you have um, you know a specific distance between the floor on the front porch, and then you have the additional, I'm not sure how many feet, it's kind of tough to read, but maybe like two feet or a foot and a half or something like that. Yeah, really but nice, like a veranda back there, a nice lofty ceiling for the rear porch. Mm -hmm. and, and did you want I that, did you want that step down for the interior to have that, um, I guess, for to have that multiple level kind of character, or what was the intention for that? I couldn't quite that? hear your question. The intention for dropping the floor on that back addition, that was just, um, Sure, I think just to make a nicer transition to the rear yard. Okay. And I think, I don't think the homeowners do intend in the future to put in a pool. Um, they host a lot of grandkids often and this backyard suits their future needs for a big family gathering space. And, and I'll note that the two spaces we're talking about are broken by a fence. So in reality, you'll never really perceive those columns or see it's them in the, the back same too, time. so it's not a hill that I would from right, the, I was, from I the street you'll see a capital. Even, even with a six foot fence, you know, you, you'll only see a port, tiny portion of that. You're column. gonna see very little of this at all because of the nature of the lot. It sits fairly high off the street compared to a lot of others. Um, 
nearby, so I don't, I have questions about the fence, but not about the addition. Yeah, it sounds like <laughs> the addition maybe we're all okay, or you know, we've kind of discussed maybe in, in the past as well, but um, so you want the eight foot fence with stucco, that's kind of where that's so, at, right? Yeah, and, and if, so we can refer to the site plan just to be really clear. It, it's not like this fence wraps a giant portion of the yard. So it really just creates privacy from the very back of the existing historic structure. So basically we're giving their entire side yard to the public. I mean, it is open to the street yard. Um, but from the back of that historic structure, just to where our, con um, our driveway enters, which is quite a ways from our back property line. You know, it's almost 30 feet. So for that portion, the eight foot fence, what it would serve to do is create a barrier between a very busy street and like I said, this family oasis of a backyard. And I look around the neighborhood, I see this type of condition frequent, especially on corner lots, especially on busy streets. Um, Commissioner Jordan mentioned where we are located, it's kind of at the top of the hill, but that doesn't change the fact that, so the, the only reason I say that is some, sometimes we get these taller walls, I understand, just due to the topography um, as the finished grade of the home approaches the street grade. And, and so yeah, you know, certain places it's just tall because of that. Here, the eight foot just really serves to create a barrier that I think is needed. Even at six feet, it's, you, you can still see over, you know, you can still hear people, it's still sound travels. And I, I just feel like since we've seen it so done in other parts of the district, and I could certainly bring many examples for you all to see and provide you with a presentation and a map showing how often this condition occurs. But I think here it's the unique circumstances. This is probably the most busy thoroughfare through the district. Walker Avenue is busy all throughout the day and even increased times like uh, between business hours of arriving and leaving the eight to five, but also for school pickups. We've got an elementary school on this road. So for all those considerations, I just think we're not asking for the entire house to be wrapped with an eight foot fence by any means. This is just a little stretch and, and really it's just a, a, a bit of a privacy fence for the homeowners. So Holly, I just want to get some clarity. Um, sure. When you say like these are common throughout the neighborhood, mm -hmm. they're actually not. They're common throughout Heritage Hills who has um, a bit of some different HG sure. standards are actually not common throughout Mesta Park. Oh, you're right. In in this direct area. Yes, Probably absolutely. within a three mile um, And I only want to note sure. it because Heritage Hills does actually have different fencing guidelines than Mesta Park. So I just think it's important to note for the, the, the transparency. Does Mesta Park have the 75% um, I think fencing's all the same. Okay, for I was everybody. under the impression that Heritage Hills had the 75% um, transparent. That's for everybody. That's for everybody, mm -hmm. okay. So that's for everybody on side and corner yards? The, um, no, the transparency, with the 75% transparency has to do with if you're going to be um, forward of that 40% mark in okay. the side yard, then for corner lots, we just have language that says um, fencing at corner lots should be partially transparent. Okay, so sorry for the confusion on that, that's on me. Um, your examples that you referenced, are they in Mesta Park or in Heritage yes. Hills along um, yeah, Walker? Um, we, we see a lot, like there's one, a lot, there's several along Hudson, um, there's several along Harvey, and then you see a lot down Dewey as well as Lee, where that's where you'll see the increase in topography change. So, so again, part of it's a retaining wall and then part of it's a fence, I get that, you know, I'm not, and, and we're in, in some of those areas, it's like 16 foot above the sidewalk, you know? So again, the, what I meant, I guess, is that these privacy areas are given to these corner lots in this direct neighborhood, mm -hmm. surround, in, within a you know, two mile radius, perhaps. But I, I could probably bring at least eight to 10 examples that I already have on my phone of different types of tall, completely solid masonry walls along corner lots. Well, and I mean, I, I have two questions. One sure. is we, we generally don't give that exception on eight foot 
fences, and, and there's the exact opposite situations where some people don't even have a fence, they have wrought iron fences, and they live with it. I, I don't really think privacy, that I could state privacy is a unique circumstance because privacy is not a design feature uh, or like a tree or something. I, I don't feel like uh, to say more privacy to me is a dangerous area for me to go because to have people come in after them and say, well, I need an eight foot fence because I need privacy too. So it's really not unique. Maybe everybody wants more privacy, and it's not really unique to this situation. So I don't think privacy would qualify as a unique circumstance for eight-foot fence here. And the other is, I would like to hear why you all selected the stucco. Is there a historic or design reason other than other people's, not using other houses in the neighborhood, but for this house, what would be the design or historic reason for selecting a material that is not already used on the property? So uh, as a product and an application, it's quite historic. I mean, this dates back to what we see now, in I'm talk Italy. I'm talking is about the house. a masonry wall with about finish of stuck. So my answer would be for the maintenance of, of that's, this That's not masonry. historic, nor is it design-wise. I'm asking if you're the designer and you're picking a fence for a house mm -hmm. to be compatible in design, mm -hmm. why did you pick this? Deco. Again, it's zero to no maintenance for 100 years or more. Uh, and also, something that the staff missed but was part of the revised packet is we show, we the homeowners decided to do a stucco chimney as well. Again, we don't have brick on the main house, so uh, we decided to pick stucco instead. The homeowners like the look of it. We do and see it in once the district. Again, Holly, I think that you're not answering the question because all of those, to me, all of those answers are point to not appropriate to this particular property. I, I don't well, really understand how we can as a could both be considered appropriate here because neither are currently on. If brick is allowed, why not stucco? I mean, if there's brick question. on the house, then that would make some sense. Perhaps, yeah. But I'm saying since there is a lack of other material other than wood siding, in this just, case, we get to choose. We chose stucco. Well, we I say guess, you know, mo than modest garages for modest houses, mm -hmm. high-end garages for high-end houses. To me, this is kind of the garage type thing for this house. How does this type of fence meet the that criteria for? Does it meet the you know overall well, idea you know, of that house? A stucco fence too. If you'll if you'll go with me, it, it's pretty nondescript. It's flat. It's all the same color. There's no divide, you know, there's not mortar joints and grout lines. Um, so it's a simple looking fence. Uh, I could. And, and get, I, I would disagree with that because I think it's actually kind of a very substantial look, which I think is, you know, is not really compatible with the wood house. The wood house. But anyway, that's, so that's all I have to say about it. Can you jump back to the. It is um, 70 feet of frontage. 70 feet. Yes, it's no, not it's a not. small area. I agree. 17 times 5 or whatever. Yeah, that is. Yeah. And I mean, I'm with you. This it. is two blocks down the street for me. I'm with you that like that alley definitely supports it architecturally. But there is a pretty clear difference in the mm -hmm. um, homes along Walker that are in Heritage Hills versus Mesta Park. I live in Mesta Park. They're um, typically up and down that stretch quite a bit more humble than those that are on the Heritage Hills side of Walker, which is, I think, like where I'm kind of struggling coming from. Um, of course. But just jumping back to the chimney, did you say that the chimney has been stucco all along and it's just not? No, I, it, I missed a little bit of what you said, that maybe it wasn't referenced in the staff report. Yeah, I think, I think it got missed, but it, it, I, I, I did change it on this scope of work um, to a stucco chimney. It's also represented in all the drawings it does as a stucco, stucco yeah, chimney. Yeah, it does. Um, thank you. And it, but this is... So the stucco chimney is part of the revised submission, not Correct. a part of the, um, the March submission. Correct. Okay. Same, in fact, um, we, the, the chimney will no longer function as a wood-burning fireplace, so we were able to reduce it in size, which I think helped with some of the proportionality issues from the last meeting. Um, so we were able to reduce it in size and width, and in doing so, after talking with the, my clients, a stucco, fireplace was uh, more appealing and so we went with that it's it's got a recessed panel and some trim to to give it some architectural detail um, 
similar to what you see in the fence. So I did not note that that had changed in the drawings. Um, I do want to note that there is brick on the house. The porch columns and the knee walls at the front steps and the oh, stem right. wall are all brick. Um, in some areas it's painted, in some areas it's not. Um, but yes, my apologies for that. I didn't catch that the chimney was a different material from, That's true. from the, the last time around. The columns are brick. And Katie, the if you had um, noted that it was a different material, is that something staff would have still recommended for approval? Not to put you on the spot. Yeah, no, well, you know, I, I mean, I, I feel like I would need to look around a little. I, my gut says I feel like we don't typically see a lot of stucco on houses that are otherwise wood siding. I feel like usually it's wood siding with, with brick details, um, maybe cast concrete, you know, caps at the front porch and that sort of thing. I don't feel like we see a lot of stucco. Usually we see stucco paired with brick. Um, but I have absolutely nothing to base that on other than just my kind of gut, you know, the image that's in my mind. Um, so I, I, I certainly I, would have called you the commission's attention to it, that that was a different material. I surveyed material. the neighborhood and we do see plenty of examples Can in the Can you cite some of the examples of the stucco fences within Mesta Park, not here yeah. at Hills? Uh, yes, not off the top of my head. Um, you can go grab your phone if, if you, you want do to. Do you mind? I'm wondering, so you want to opaque you know, an opaque fence for privacy, um, and this fireplace is new, if I'm not mistaken, right? I wonder, I mean, and there is some brick on the porch columns, is that correct? The base of the porch columns is brick, as well as the um, yeah, stem right. wall on the house and the, like, the knee walls at the front steps are I mean, brick with a cast stone cap. On the existing On the house. existing okay. house, yes. From a material it's standpoint, brick, not CMU. I just... I think it's CMU. There's a there's at least portions of it that are. Let me go back to the pictures. Hold on. Point being, there are brick elements on the house, right? Yeah, it looks painted. The base brick. of the porch columns are brick. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was almost. I the mean, if you just made porch. the fence brick and the chimney brick, and made it six foot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know if that would be. Um, I'm with you. I um I personally like adore the masonry fences. I think they're such a nice look, but I do agree with Joe that I think, you know, something you stated um, in your explanation as to why they desired such a serious fence was, you know, the sound travels and they want to be in their backyard, but that is part of living urbanly and living in a high density area. Um, so I think that's just kind of like you get what you get. Yeah, that's inherited. Well, um, and I mean, that's just, just to note that like one thing you've said over and over is how present they are, but each of those are in Heritage Hills. And so they are two to, I realize they obviously flow right into each other, yeah, but they are two like specific historic districts. Okay. Um, with very distinct characteristics. For the sake of. I think they're both historic too. Mm -hmm. The fences you're showing. They're yes. Not, they're not new fences. Yes, I, I believe you're right. Hey, there you go, Mesta Park. No one knows them. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I really like masonry fences. I'm just struggling with the use of materials relevant to the house and the height. So I, I appreciate the attempt to show images with the photo, but our municipal counselor is advising that we shouldn't be sharing images and documents that we don't have That's a, new material. In, in the record. Yeah. <laughs> But, I don't know what it is. But if, I mean, I'm sure, Holly, if you can text those to me just so we have a record of what everybody's I'd be happy to. looking at up here. I'll do that in, yeah. immediately. So it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like we're in agreement on almost all the items except for the fence was kind of a sticking point. All right. And I'm wondering if there is a clear path forward today. You know, I think you have one more continuous left. I don't know. Is this something that we can resolve? Do you need to go back and speak with a homeowner, do you think? Or? I would really like to see today that we uh, approve the addition because, again, the homeowners would like, I mean, they yeah. are carrying two mortgages, like they already live in the district. So addition, good, and then maybe continue the fence. And, okay. and I'd be okay with that, but I, to me, um, one condition there is the potentially the chimney. Yeah. The chimney right, that's being, still being good information. Okay. Do you feel like you know, the chimney if, needs if to If the match. chimney goes ahead forward with, with stucco and then we, we make you change the fence to brick, then the chimney feels weird. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I have no issues with that. And then 
I would make a You know, the chimney would probably be installed very last. I think yeah. maybe even the material, like if we need to clarify that with staff, I'm, I'm, or it, maybe it hinges on the material chosen for the privacy fence or that approval. Like, I'm fine with that too. Yeah, I don't think it needs to hang it up. One, okay. one comment on the fence that I would suggest looking at, um, you kind of see the picture here where you have the mm -hmm. kind of articulation of the pilasters and the yes. columns at the corners. It's, it's small, it's nitpicky, but the fence at the southeast corner doesn't have a pilaster and it just feels kind of uh, yeah. not like the corner's not articulated. So maybe if you do look at the fence, maybe look at that spacing and how that southeast corner uh, right. is taken care of. So Katie, you know, staff did recommend approval of the stucco fence if it was reduced to six feet, but then you did also say that you would have noted um, the stucco fireplace. So I think I'm a little conflicted about what staff would, if it would have been a different recommendation had it, had we been made aware that the fireplace was stucco, um, because I'm assuming if you recommend the stucco fence, probably the fireplace would have been, I don't know. So Right, so we, the condition on the fence, it was recommended for approval with a condition that the height be reduced to no more than six feet, that more accurate documentation of the gate be submitted, and that if directed by the commission, the applicant submit revisions to the fence, including changes to placement or materials to staff, and that was to get at the, the stucco issue, that if you all felt stucco was not appropriate, um, that that revision be submitted to staff. Um, I'm... Um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think my, my personal professional opinion is that very few of the fences that we see anywhere in these historic districts are anywhere close to what was present historically. Nobody had a cedar fence with cap and trim in 1912. It, so a stucco fence is perhaps no less appropriate than a, a wood fence with cap and trim or many other fence styles that we see. Um, the, the fence is not attached to the house. I'm a little less bothered by fence material and design than I, than I would have perhaps been thoughtful about um, the use of stucco on the addition to the house. Um, so, but I also think it makes sense that if you're doing brick on one, it should be brick on the other. If you're, if you're comfortable with stucco on one, then perhaps stucco's okay on the other um, since they kind of talk to each other. So in order to, if we were to move the addition forward today, um, would it be preferable to the commission to um, do that with stated conditions to go back to staff regarding materials? Or like, how do we want to, do we want to separate that from the fence? I don't know what the right answer is. I think one option would be to just pick a material and approve it with the material that you pick. <laughs> and that's what's captured in the CA. Continue the fence. And when the fence comes back, we could also um, consider a revision to the approval for the addition to change the material of the chimney should if that should if the you know depending on how the homeowner feels about it um, so it does that make sense at all no I mean I don't I'm can we not just uh, approve the addition with the condition that um, before the uh, that when approve the addition with the condition that the uh, materials for the fireplace, I mean, I think we're saying I think you're right. should match. The, the, the condition that the, the material for the fireplace match, the, the fireplace and chimney be, be determined. Just uh, to, be, yeah. I don't know how to phrase or, it. Just to uh, throw a wrench in it, would you think if you, uh, if we came to some agreement on material, would you be open to the six foot, or is that something you have to go back? Yeah, and I was just going to say, what um, if we do this? What if we approve everything at the six foot stucco and stucco fireplace, and then if we want to bring back a revision to go to eight feet, we can we can do that. How about that? So I mean, if we're already recommending stucco. approval at a six foot height, we do, have and we can do this today. Like, let's just yeah, button the, it up. The, and then I could bring a different proposal to change the fence height. Sure. The, the, the stucco Sorry, give me seems like an odd choice contextually. However, I don't know that there's meat in the guidelines to say that you can't do it. I do. 
We see I do. I mean, in every the, word, it has history. to be compatible with the, mm -hmm. you know, the architecture of that specific site, and 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 there's just it, that is just not a commonly used, you know, to do a house and then do the fence. It's completely different. The wood to me is like a wire fence. It's the wood fence today is the wire fence of yesterday. I mean, it was just a basic fence, you know, and so the basic fence. Uh, it can, you know, it can be anywhere. We allow them in any situation. But when it comes to having something that really is going to look to other people like it's always been there, to me, there's just, it's, 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 there's a compatibility issue there. It's just too heavy for the wood house. And I struggle with the stucco fireplace. So therefore, because of that, I, I struggle with the stucco fence. Is there an opposition to brick painted to match the existing brick that's already on the front of the home. Just trying to understand. Um, I missed the stucco fireplace I mean, too, I, so I'm just trying to get clarity on something that I may have missed. I mean, I think that they could bring that forward as a... But, but am I hearing you all right that if, if we were to do a brick chimney with the addition then that would feel appropriate and approvable today, right? It would to me, but I don't want to, this is not my home. I would um, say it would to me right. personally, but it's not my home and I'm not, you know, proposing I, that you do yeah, something. I feel that like if feel the right. addition hinges on that, how do we feel? I don't think the addition because is Because we can approach the fence on. separately is what I'm saying. Right. Like if I, we, no, Holly, I think that we all want to approve the addition correct. and just make some sort of condition of what the chimney material will be like upon approval of the fence. That's all we're gotcha. saying. So if the fence is approved in a month or whatever, the, the, you would know th that we would also consider that final material for the fireplace. Right, and th which wouldn't be installed till right. much so the, down the line. So, so we're it's wanting not like to we're trying the, to. We're wanting to approve the addition. And do we need clear because of the way it's lumped on the gate before we motion anything? The driveway and the gate. gate's going to be just a simple wood um, with, you know, metal trim gate. It's a four or five foot gate. Right, and, and to clarify, my comment wasn't about the gate. It was just right. about the corner of the fence. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're going to continue the fence and then do the approval of the addition with the condition that the material be selected with Defense yeah, that the approval. condition that the material for the fireplace and chimney be specified at the time of the review of the fence, yes. Perfect. approval of the fence. Thank, that would be great, guys. I, I missed what additional documentation we're waiting for for the approval of the fence. Like, what do we want to see in a couple months for the approval of the fence? Well, it, I don't think it's a fence. Again. I think it's a driveway gate. I was just reading, reading through here trying to find it. Was. The, ga the gate's correct? way set back. It's like at the edge of the garage, which is way set back into the middle of the property. So yeah, we just have like a line drawing of the gate, and it wasn't clear continuance on to me fence. if that was, uh, you know, what elements of that was transparent, back. what was wood, what was metal, what was transparent. And then my understanding was we wanted to continue the fence for kind of further evaluation of whether or not stucco was an appropriate material. Okay, so the driveway I, gate would be continued would, with... Yeah, the, I think okay. the, the gate and the fence okay. all go together. And I was mentioning, I was, I was kind of trying to maybe see if we could get everything approved. I know that we're going to have a lot of, you know, summer's always really busy, and um, I'm just not sure. It'll be the exact same discussion next time I feel like, you know, eight-foot fence yeah. at stucco, and then fireplace at stucco, and so I just, I don't know, I, I was wondering if there's a way we could find uh, a solution you know, this meeting that we could just approve it. I appreciate you know, that but, very much. Um, it sounds like there's some flexibility from the homeowners. I don't know if there's, I mean, it's basically, it, if it was just a six foot wood fence, it'd be approved right now, no issue. Even um, a six foot stucco fence apparently would be a, a proof or recommended for approval by staff. Sounds like that was the language. I mean, you did make a point about the fact that none of these fences are really historical per se. So, yeah, whether it's stucco or brick or whatever, you know. And we um, do see lots of examples. I think, to me, more importantly, it's the six foot, you know, height than the material. Maybe uh, my fellow commissioners may disagree with me on that, but 
I definitely agree on the height, only I, I just think it's a little bit of a tricky precedent to set um, as we're seeing more and more, you know, kind of, I think the term somebody used last meeting was resort backyards. Um, I think it's a tricky precedent to set saying that we're going to allow eight foot fencing um, okay. because it's just there's, to Joe's point, like there's no support of it in the guidelines. Um, I agree. I think six foot is uh, pretty. I mean, we already have rules, six yeah. feet on the sides and eight foot on the back. And I mean, we really, we've told a lot of people. And to me, that's pretty black and white six. and the material is kind they're, they're, of the a little bit of a gray area. Perhaps the homeowners are saying fine. they're good with six, so yeah. non-issue. Can we make a motion to approve as staff recommends? I dare you to try. <laughs> no, I do want to make sure on. that we're clear I, on I was, if we're... I, I'm not for it, so okay. I will not vote for a, approving the fence. I want to make sure that we're clear on the chimney because we had back and forth on the chimney being contingent upon the fence. I won't vote on the addition oh. if the addition has the stucco. I think that it would not be appropriate as a stucco fireplace. <laughs> it seems, okay, well, it sounds it seems like incompatible, we, but I'm trying to compare I, I if you went with a brick fence. Like, I don't know that a 70 foot long blue painted brick fence is a great solution. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend painting it either. I don't, you know, I don't know. So, no. is, is that, is that a, a to me, is the, it's back to the design. Is that a design, a material that you would use to be compatible with the design of the house? Just, just like, if I may, just like you're saying, so because we don't have a texture, like we don't have a brick texture, a stone texture to match, even the brick, the very little brick that's on those columns is painted and has been painted for a long time. So instead of introducing a whole new texture, like brick pattern, we're just keeping a very simple finish. Masonry is both st stucco and CMU and there's lots of different it, masonry it, products. It is simple, but it has masonry fence has a statement, and that is it is very private and heavy. Yeah. I mean, there's no. But a six foot stucco fence is allowed for in the guidelines. So that's only is there is there a color referenced on the fence? Um, I well, hadn't thought about it until you said a, yeah. a big blue fence. Um, by by owner. Well, we'll yeah. probably go like a tone or two darker than the house. Okay, just. Yeah, that was just a maybe. Maybe period. even a tone or two darker on just the top trim of the pilasters. I will also note that fence is. I mean, the original house is pretty much all exposed in the front, or maybe even right. the entire maybe even the side addition. yard. Right, it's the all the entire so side. So it's really yard. just that back mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. half of all. But yeah, I'm not sure if the materials. Is some, you know, that's not something that I. I think Katie made an interesting point on that. I think to me the important part is the height and if, they're, if the homeowners are open to being flexible on the height. Um, yeah, we'll go with six. Yeah, I'm not sure. Sure. But it sounds like, I'm not sure if you have, uh, you know, it sounds like there's some conflict on that. So that might be a risk. <laughs> I mean, a, a wood fence would be, um, we could just continue it. Do you want to continue it? And then we'll hear it next oh. time and then. <laughs> well, then do we have a motion or do we need more discussion, I guess? Because I think we've- You know, next, it, 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 even if, we continue it because they've said, okay, we'll give up on the eight foot. We'll do a six foot stucco fence. But all I'm going to do is going to bring you a bunch of examples of these stucco fences throughout the district and show you that it's not that unlikely. All right, maybe we, maybe we just put this up to a vote. I just then... would like to respond to that, Holly. We cannot make, and it says in the guidelines, we cannot make decisions on individual properties by using examples other than that. We can, we can look at them, we can talk about them, but that is still not the main reason. Everybody else has one is not the main reason that we make a final decision on designs for, uh, that are put I'm, in front of us. I'm sorry I'm disappointed. Um, that's not what I meant. You did. You said, what I'll bring I, back more examples and more pictures to show you. It's been recommended for approval because it is compatible with the guidelines, is a what I meant. All right. Well, would, I think would the stucco fire would the stucco fireplace had it been known would that have been approved by the staff? You know, it's. Uh, I'm going to say that I don't think I would have recommend. I think I would have said that brick was a more appropriate material. Um, That's how I feel as well. Uh, I think there's already brick on the house. I think the typical material that we see for a chimney on a wood house is brick. Um, 
had I had time, I perhaps would have looked around for other houses of a similar style and similar materials to get a better sense of, okay, is this, is this common? Do we see stucco on chimneys on wood houses? Um, but my gut right now says, no, stucco is really not an appropriate material for a chimney on this type of house with, with brick at the porch columns. Um, brick is the more appropriate material. And I'm very sorry that I didn't catch it we're and then I'm like doing this historic. off the cuff. We're putting it on the addition and we're also adding a six foot stucco fence. So like you said, these two now talk to each other and are now part of the new scape. Your not the historic scape. have decided that they would be happy to install a brick chimney okay. since it goes well with the style of their house and would, would like the commission to consider the stucco fence at six foot tall as a separate feature in the yard, not attached to the house. Yeah, I was gonna suggest if we break into two separate item, you know, two different votes, the addition and then the fence, then that might be a way forward. So do we have any other comments from the public? All right, and my, do we have my, a- My comment would be, I, I, would, I would ask to consider the repetition of the pilasters on the stucco fence as part of staff approval. For the fence. Like to be submitted to staff as a, after, as part of, as a condition of the approval. And that's just, you're talking about the pilaster at the at rear the corner. corner. And, the, and the spacing of it. Okay. Is that something staff feels that they can review? Um, I think that kind of change is something we can review. I don't know that I fully understand what you're looking for. I understand it. I understood <laughs> putting the pilaster at the at the corner at the rear. Yeah. I, well, I'm not following. All I'm the fine with it. I mean, I, I I just think your eye is going to pick up going down that that corner is not. So if if the if yeah, staff feels like the pilaster at the corner solves yeah, solves it, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Essentially, there's a row of pilasters, and there's not one at the corner, which seems, you know, there's nothing to yeah. anchor that corner. So, so are you thinking one at the corner and then make the rest of them more evenly spaced? Is that what you were saying? I, I understood be, the comment about the corner. Yeah, I, I think it would be worth a study to see what that would look like. Your proportions may get too square. And since that's part of the fence, maybe we can add that as a, well, I guess we're voting on it. So I think it's worth a condition if we want to. Staff understands the intent. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. And you're comfortable with us just working through that with the applicant and settling on something. Sorry. Okay. You're comfortable with us just working through the pilaster yeah. comment with the applicant. Okay, cool. Okay, so Holly, I just want to make sure before we pilasters. put this to a vote, so um, you are uh, good for us to proceed with the vote on the addition and then on the fence at six feet. Wait a second. Okay. And did you hear our discussion about the condition? Yes. Okay. All right, do we have a motion? Who wants to make this motion? So we do have the, the addition listed separately from the fence. So I think the motion to approve the addition is pretty simple. We're just noting the condition that the chimney be brick. Okay, so that would be items two, three, and five. Yes. Okay, for HPCA 22-00017, I motion to approve items two, three, and five with the agreed upon conditions that the materials on the proposed chimney will be brick. I'll second. Okay. Motion made by Commissioner Jordan, second by Commissioner Remy, I think. Please vote in prime time. All right, the addition is approved. And for the second item. Do we have a motion? So I think four, seven, and nine are all together as well. For the fence, seven four, plus four, five, yes. four, four, seven, four, seven, four, seven, and nine. nine. Yes. Oh. So I'll make a motion for HPCA-22-00017 
dash zero zero one seven zero 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 one seven for items four seven and nine with the um, condition that the fence is reduced to six foot in height and the additional findings in the staff report. Do we want to add that about the pilasters? Or? And that the they work with with staff on the pilasters for the fence. So pilaster on the corner and then even look at spacing. Yeah, yeah I would say the to address the spacing corner the, corner. the pl placement and spacing of pilasters. Yes. Perfect. And I'll second that. All right. So we had a motion by Commissioner Poor and a second by Commissioner Milner. And you are approved. All right, thank you. Just to make sure, Mr. Remy, did you intend to vote no on that? Okay. You had a condition, so I double checked. <laughs> yeah, I still like the condition, but still not sold <laughs> that it's compatible. <laughs> All right, moving on to item uh, seven, HPCA 220020. This is at 428 Northwest 29th Street, Jefferson Park, Ward 2. Consideration of possible action on application by James Hoover, Puro Clean of Broken Arrow for William Snodgrass for certificate of appropriateness to one, reconstruct roof, including soffits, fascia, exposed rafter tails, and gutters and downspouts elective. Two, replace asbestos siding shingles above ceiling height with cementitious shingles elective. Three, replace all windows, including replication of trim and mullions elective. Four, replace patio doors elective. Five, remove storm windows elective, and six, replace air conditioner in bricked wall opening elective. This is all repair work related to a fire that occurred, um, and staff has recommended approval of all items with um, the condition that any historic siding that is under the asbestos siding where that has to be removed be photographed and documented just to include in the file for the record of the property. They're not removing enough of it to require them to take all of it off and go back to the historic material, but because some of it has is coming off, um, we just want to capture that information for future projects. All right, thank you, Katie. Could you state your name and address, please? James Hoover, 7308 South Sycamore, Broken Arrow. All right, appreciate it. And do we have any comments? It sounds like staff is recomm recommending approval. Sounds pretty straightforward. There are some Let's see specific findings um, and the, the condition that you'll uh, document that. Any other comments from commissioners? Or? Do we have any comments from the public? All right. Do we have a motion? I make a motion to approve HPCA 220020 with the specific findings and conditions as noted by the staff in the staff report. Thank you. All right. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Meacham and second by Commissioner Milner. <clears throat> and you are approved. That was easy. Appreciate it. All right. Next item, uh, item eight, HPCA 22-00029. This is located at 521 Northwest 16th Street, Mesta Park, Ward 6. Consideration and possible action on application by Josh and Miller for certificate of appropriateness to one, install solar shingles elective. This is a proposal to install solar, solar shingles on the sides of a hip gable roof. Um, and I'm sure the applicant will describe in further detail. These are shingles that are intended to approximate the appearance of a roof shingle. Um, it's installed similarly to a solar panel, but the exposed surface um, is a different, different material, a different appearance. Um, the guidelines are, are not supportive in general of solar installations that are, are visible from the street or public right of way. So we did recommend a continuance on this item because of that, uh, those guidelines. All 
All right, could you please state your name and uh, address, please? Uh, Josh and Miller, 521 Northwest 16th Street. All right, appreciate it. And it sounds like, um, yeah, does anyone have any comments on this? It looks like a little bit different product than what we've seen in the past, so. Yeah, I, I have a question, um, maybe more for staff, just because what we're looking at um, feels to me like that's not what's referenced in the guidelines um, because the visibility is so different. Uh, for one thing, this isn't a particularly visible part of the house, if I'm looking at it correctly, but also just um, these stand out quite a bit less than a traditional solar panel. So does, has staff um, seen something like this before and used the guidelines to support or deny it in the past? I don't believe we've seen this specific product before. Um, and the guidelines do talk about solar panels and solar shingles. Um, there's not images of what's meant by panels or shingles, um, but the guidelines do reference them uh, when they're talking about that they must be installed on back-facing roof slopes, et cetera. Um, but I agree, I think they look less visibly, visually prominent than your typical solar panel, but no, we haven't, as far as I'm aware, we haven't reviewed this particular um, product in the past. Okay, thank you. I have a question for you. Yeah. So when I read this and it's like, install solar shingles, I was literally thinking they were shingles that, you know, were still, are these, it's still a panel though. Yeah, this is actually that, a that panel. That surface mounts mm -hmm. that is up from the surface of the roof. Yeah, so it's it's in line with the roof, but slightly above. Okay. But it and is a. Uh, they basically match your shingles. Okay. With a, it's like a wrap, on top of the panel, so that it actually matches your particular shingles. So it's something that's added to a panel. There's a number, of, a number of companies that do it. That so it's not technically there are solar shingles, which is something different. Okay. Um, these are panels that are. But this have, is kind of a, a hybrid version. A of that. shingle facade, yeah. They're actually a company started doing it actually in 2012 in response to some historic preservation requirements in uh, Washington State, okay. and so it's kind of that's kind of where I found it was looking at some other examples and other historic preservation districts around the country. Because my thought is the only way you're going to know that those are shingles is with this bird's eye aerial view. If I'm on the street, I'm just gonna look up and they're gonna look like solar panels. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I just wanna make sure I'm totally understanding the Are design of this. you saying like this. from underneath, kind of, if you're? Well, from where the general public is gonna be viewing, it's still gonna, it's just gonna look like a solar panel, correct? Because it's, it's surface mounted, it's lifted up among. Well, and, and I think there's some pictures on there. Um, so they're, they're a few key spots on our block where you can actually see the roof. So if you're standing in front of the house, you're not gonna see the roof. Um, when these trees have leaves, you're not gonna see the roof from most spots, but, so when you're able to see the roof, you're yeah. going to be able to see that, the, the top facing shingle um, facade. facade. Yes, yes, so the frame is wrapped as well. To, to look like the shingles. To, it's like a, is it like a vinyl wrap? Yes, okay. I don't know that it's vinyl, but okay. yeah. It but is like, it, like I'm just trying to draw something that I can wrap my head around. Like a, I, I'm, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, the, you the would, frame of that also has the shingle look that goes around. Right, and you'll be able to see that there, there's something there. It's not that it would be invisible. Um, like it'll match the color kind of texture, just be like a, a few inches above the roof, kind of a, a slim panel, but. Yes. You know, I mean, this is a topic, you've heard me talk about this, that kind of frustrates me because um, I think the guidelines can be pretty restrictive about this and there's not a lot of flexibility and also the nature of living on east-west streets where you have some homeowners on the north side of the street, some homeowners on the south side of the street. And essentially, if you're living on the south side of the street and the back of your house is facing south, the whole, you know, all those people could have solar panels and ideal placements. 
and you pretty much eliminate the north, you know, people who live on the north side of the street from having um, the ability to really have solar panels that would make any kind of sense, you know, financially. And I think, I think that's a problem, and I see that you've installed them, or, or where you're suggesting is, um, you know, it's not street facing. It is on the side, and I think that, to me, that just makes sense from a, you know, you do have a unique product that is intended to be as visually, you know, low impactful. I know at some point maybe they will have some kind of actual, you know, tiles that, um, you know, that may actually look like the roof exactly. But to me, I think this is not something that's like a permanent fixture on the house, you know, in 20 years or 10 years when technology improves, you know, these panels probably need to re be replaced anyway at that point. Um, you know, I'm sure they'll be even lower profile and even more, uh, you know, kind of hidden. So to me, I think this applicant has taken, taken steps by putting them on the east and the west, which is not necessarily the west face maybe, but I mean, ideally you'd have them on the south. But, you know, he's taken steps to make them as visually um, insignificant and finding this product, to me, I just don't understand. You know, if we don't approve these solar panels here, it's kind of like, in effect, I don't know if we would allow solar panel. You know, we might as well just ban solar panels in HP neighborhoods. But I think there's such benefit to having them, especially now. And you know, energy independence is always a big topic. I just, I don't know. To me, I think it's a, a good compromise. Yeah, uh, I um, I tend to agree. I think that we have. You know, of course, they're not historic looking. I think we've approved all sorts of things that are not historic looking for um, just simple desire and not necessarily for a good cause. So I think this is probably the best case scenario for doing something like this, and I lean towards an approval on it. I, I don't think it's approvable. I, 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 I agree. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't see how you, what's your unique circumstance that you would stay? Well, I, I, I think it's, it's going to, I appreciate the effort in trying to camouflage it, but it's a solar panel on a roof visible from the public right away. So based on the guidelines, I, I, don't, I don't see that it's approvable. I agree. I know we've talked about this, and maybe it's something that we need to have further discussion on about the guidelines and potentially adapting them. But until then, I don't think we can, we can approve this. I don't think it's approvable. I would just know, sorry for not interrupting, just um, in kind of researching this, um, we have we have seen um, normal just black solar panels approved in the Norman Historic District um, that are in a similar way, east-west uh, roof face, not facing the street. Um, and just looking around the country, um, and as well, I'm going to pull this right, the National Alliance of Preservation Commission. Um, you know, they give guidelines. Obviously, we have our own guidelines here. You guys have the guidelines you're looking at. Um, but what they say is to preserve the character, defining features, and historic fabric while accommodating the need for solar access to the greatest extent possible. And so that's kind of uh, getting to what you were saying. My thought is, is, it, is this a conversation? Is this possible? Or is there no scenario? where in Oklahoma City, historic district, solar will be allowed. Um, I, I like what that said. And I'm, if our guidelines said that, then I think that we would be approving this. But our guidelines don't. I, I understand that. I think, I think there are some unique circumstances that we could find. I mean, again, there are guidelines. You know, and, and as commissioners, it's our you know, kind of purview to interpret those guidelines. And, and while we do need to use them as, as a guide, I think the unique circumstance here to me is that it's an undue burden that only some homeowners could fully take advantage of solar panels um, if, you know, if they've taken every possible measure to make them as, as kind of historically, in, um, how do you say it, inoffensive, however you want to say it, and to me, I mean, the fact that they're on the side, they're low profile. But ours says must, there. must. And, and to me, legally, you know, how do you, how do you get around that if it, there's a legal challenge? It says must. Well, they I think, must be I think legally, we as commissioners can, 
you know, we interpret the guidelines, but I think our, our decisions will supersede, you know, that specific I, language if, in the, if in the I, guidelines. I, I would tell you one thing that would convince me would be how much does it cost and how much are you going to save? Because we say, hey, it's a really, it's an environmental, whatever, green, all of that I get. But I mean, I, I guess personally, I've never pursued it. I don't know that much about it. But I would think if we cha ever change the guidelines, that I would want to know, you know, our, we make, sometimes we make it sound like that we're putting such a burden on somebody that could really gain maybe financially from it. When I've never really read anything that shows you would see you pay this much money and, and within the next five years you're going to financially gain from having these plus the environmental. So yeah, it, financial gain may not be a consideration though. Then, um, that's certainly not anything that we could consider Right, in, but so I'm saying without, guidelines. but we still look at all information when we make changes. But if, I, if anyway, I, I just I feel like that it, I'm not totally against it. I do think that people that live in historic districts traditionally, particularly in Oklahoma City, that have lived here for a long time, are not for it, and they depend on the guidelines to um, protect their property, and and that's what they're that's why they live here is because they you know, want to be in a protected area. So I feel like it, that makes it really hard for me when I feel like the majority of people want to keep the look and that's why they're living there. And then they look at their guidelines and then they don't understand, well, why did you let somebody when it says they must be installed? We can't really trust the guidelines. I mean, we, we do try to go with the ones that say yeah, must. And I totally get that and I agree with that. And, and I think that's why we have these case by case discussions, you know, and I think, you know, in this case, the impact of these panels on this house, you know, on this item is like, I mean, like a different case where someone wants to put a fence around their property. I mean, that has way more impact on the character of the neighborhood and the, you know, than, you know, some very slim, you know, wrap solar panels that are on the side of a house, you know, 20 feet up in the air that are, I don't know, to me, like, I guess to me, I understand maybe if you want to make the argument, if you're trying to, you know, preserve the character of the neighborhood. I mean, if it was gonna be on the south face, you know, if it's street facing and some big panel with a huge metal frame and it's just like in your face, you know, I mean. I mean, we're just a small but, percentage, a small percentage of the total housing in Oklahoma City. We have a group of people that live here intentionally because they wanna live in historic district and preserve a certain, uh, you know, atmosphere, era and whatever. And it just seems like there's a lot of places in Oklahoma City. We're not denying people the right to do solar panels. There's tons of homes in Oklahoma City where you can move and you can do that. So I just feel like that people live here because there's rules. And we can't just pick the rules that, you know, well, we're going to follow these rules, but not these rules. And then people out there, they just don't trust the commission to follow the rules. I'm just struggling to see how it negatively impacts the home or the surroundings. I, I agree. I, I don't think it negatively impacts at all. I do agree, too, that we live in these neighborhoods for the guidelines. Um, I do. I think these shingles are great. And as a person who lives in a historic house, I probably couldn't do it in my house now, but I would like to. I would love to have stellar shingles. And I would also be interested if a guideline is out of date, like I feel like this one is, how do we go about changing we, it? I'm all, for, yeah. I'm all for working on that. I'm all for working on that. No. I think if I will we, note, yeah. I will note that you will see these. So it is a better version, but it is a solar panel. You will see it from the public right away. Yeah, and I don't know when the guidelines were enacted, but I think for most people, most people hear solar panels, they think blue, silver, originally created for space, right? Panels. Um, and so there, is a, there are different options now. I, lo I love our neighborhood, I love our district, I, I really appreciate what you guys do. And so I'm not a person that's like, hey, we just need to do things like everyone else. We love our house. Um, and so in researching that, even with the solar shingles, they are, uh, they look much less uh, normal, I would say. They're actually made of glass. You have to replace your entire roof with glass shingles if you do solar shingles on part of them. So um, looking at this option, you know, I see things like a stucco fence, for instance, that to me is not original and doesn't necessarily even match what's around. 
And so I feel like, you know, if there's something that can actually match this house and the houses around it, that makes sense. I understand, I understand the guidelines. Um, the other thing I would note is that if you take all the houses in Mesta Park, particularly, even if you go into Heritage as well, the houses with flat roofs are almost the only ones that will fit into the guidelines because you can have a house on the south side of the street because it's not a perfectly flat neighborhood, you can see that roof from somewhere in the public right of way. So, and so it kind of makes it prohibitive for the entire neighborhood, aside from if you have a flat roof of some sort. Uh, so uh, in my one and a half years of serving on this commission, I, we have yet to approve a solar deal. Um, staff has, has we don't get a lot of applications for them. We have approved some. I think most of them have been on flat roofs um, that were where it was screened by a parapet. Um, I was just going to, on the question about the guidelines, these were, the guidelines were amended in 2012 to include things like solar panels. I'm not sure if they addressed them at all prior to that. Did we address solar before 2012? Uh, yeah. I think so. It was an energy. It was an energy addition. There was a, yeah, green, the green guidelines. And the windows were, changed. A, and the, um, what and is the process for amending it? So it's just like um, an ordinance amendment. We, um, we try not to do it terribly frequently because it makes it really confusing for applicants right. if there's a different set of guidelines every 12 months. Um, but we would be, it would be a, a process of the commission and staff developing any revisions to the guidelines that they wanted to see go forward, um, public meetings, presenting it at the commission, and then it would go to planning commission and city council okay. to be official. Okay. So. And I feel like there's been other items that we've discussed or we've, that continuously be mm -hmm. are a reoccurring topic, so maybe it's time we start to explore that. Um, I, I would also say that it's more than just, you know, looking at it on printed paper. You know, we need to touch and see these things in real life application when we make these decisions. Um, but for that reason, I would um, make a motion to deny HPCA-22-0029 um, for the reason that it doesn't um, meet the findings and our guidelines um, and hope that maybe one day we come back and um, are able to make some changes and you're able to come back in front of us and meet those guidelines. I have a, I have a question about making motions on an item like this. If the applicant wanted to put it to a vote for approval, could they ask for that and we would vote for that? And then, or is it just whatever, you know, how, what is the exact process of? I mean, I think the that fact that they applied for. means they would prefer that you right. make a motion to approve <laughs> the application. Um, would that be kind of like the first step and then if that failed, then it would be a motion, or it would just be denied in that case, or how would that I work? I mean, I think or it's just, it just really, a, I don't know, I might defer to Rita on this. It's, it would be whatever, motion carried first. If there are okay. people who wanted to approve it, they would vote against the right. motion to deny it, and then there could be another motion to approve, and if there were more votes, enough votes for that one, then that's the one that would carry. Now, another option is to continue it if, if anyone on the commission felt like they could be swayed by further documentation of, you know, more photos of what the solar shingles look like um, in a street view, um, other information about about the installation, about how how visible they would be, how how thin is the panel, that sort of thing, um, and I I'm not trying to sway you all in one direction or another, but the commission has the ability to approve things with unique circumstances that the guidelines say are not allowed. So, um, and you all do that on a regular basis. Uh, so, so since the proposed motion was for denial, not a continuance. Um, just want to make everybody really clear that it is not, if it's denial, he cannot reapply. Yeah, if it's, vote, if it's yeah, denied yeah. without prejudice, they could turn around and reapply tomorrow. Um, I just, I'm again. struggling to see the benefit in just denying um, and removing somebody the ability to come back uh, with their own time. I just it's still a vote like anything, even... so if there's a motion to deny and it fails to pass, then there could be a motion to right. approve. Okay. That I just don't think, pass. in my opinion, yeah. any additional information will make it meet the guidelines, so that's why, I mean, I don't want to waste his time, um, so that's why my motion was that, but we also it, didn't ask for the public if anybody had any Yeah, it does so. sound like, essentially, the, the sentiment 
to my fellow commissioners, pretty much if it's visible at all, regardless of what kind of panel it is, or you know, that's not provable. So I just think um, I'm a, I'm just uncomfortable approving this with and in, in potentially setting precedent and going off the guideline a couple ways and. I, I'm totally in favor of solar. I just think, because I, I, I do want to mention we did have some neighborhood notes that agreed with stack re recommendation for continuance. Th they're not giving us notes of they disagree and they think we should approve. Um, they're going to leave it up to us and they think it should be continued. I don't know any item that's going to come in another commission meeting that's going to make me change my mind because in essence I still feel like, I know it says shingles, but they are panels. They're, they're panels sitting on a roof. We're just caretakers of these neighborhoods, and if we're going to make a change that I, I think could see a lot more applications come before us, such as solar panels, we've got to engage the residents in these neighborhoods through workshops and talk to them about what does this language look like. Um, so I, I had said all that. Can I still second? Can I second this? Because I think there is <laughs> well, a motion. We haven't had any comment from the public, so I don't know. Oh, is there anyone who wants to speak from the public? I think it's Sue King. Okay. So and I, that's obviously maybe something I should have done prior to this meeting, kind of knew this, but um, if there were a continuance, we'd be happy to um, talk to people uh, and see if there is support, neighbors and people in the neighborhood to present to you. Obviously, if there's not, then. I think you know, for me, it's just, it, it, it would have to be a, 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 a large conversation with, with multiple neighbors in multiple neighborhoods coming together and looking at what the guidelines say. So This is more of like a guidelines language discussion you're suggesting, maybe more well, than this Well, I think case, it or, is because mm -hmm. I feel like if, like I said, I really appreciate the fact that the manufacturers are trying to get more savvy and, and build something that mm -hmm. makes something you really can't see, but it's not on the, the, the rear slope, it's on the sides. It's still a panel. It, it's not actually a shingle. It's a, it's a panel that sits on top. And if I have to break it down to it's a panel, and I've sat on this commission and denied other solar panels, I just, I just want to level the playing field for everybody. And if neighbors really want to do this, get together. Let's have the big conversation and workshop it through this commission and change the language. I do definitely agree that. Uh yeah, I think it's a guidelines language discussion. We do need to look at those guidelines because it's a, a, an item or an issue that's going to come up. Yeah, uh, because so. if we approve this one, then the others come up, then, ha, then we open the faucet, then ha, how do we determine? I guess, yeah, partly my view on that. Need the language yeah. updated. And, and, and I totally And I champion you know. if you want to be the one to do it. <laughs> Go round up in the neighborhoods and, and get them. But we're caretakers of these neighborhoods. Those the neighbor volunteers are the champions of it. I, I want them to have a seat at the table for that conversation if we want to make changes. I, I don't disagree with that at all. I agree with 99% of it. Um, I do think it's probably time to have the conversation. My, I'm personally a little fearful that we're going to see people um, just bucking the system and doing it and hoping they get away with it, and they may not all be as thoughtful as this approach. So um, I think it's a great idea to start the conversation and go to the neighborhood boards and see what the comfort levels are for things like this. I mean, Sarah, it's been my experience that <laughs> if people started doing that, you would never get them passed and they would go to court and get everybody's taken off because we have a lot of people in those neighborhoods that are a lot more watchful perhaps than you think. And oh, no, I know. <laughs> a lot of things get done that, you know, some things get done, but still, this has always been an issue, but I, I think this and the garages, it keeps coming up, and we've said, it's just been a bad couple of years. I think we probably would have addressed it a lot sooner than now, but because we've been dealing with it for about four years. And so just because circumstances have pushed, uh, pushed the issue of not being able to meet and go out and do public hearings and stuff like that, I think, uh, I mean, I'm all on board on trying to update. Yeah, I agree it's a conversation that needs to be had. And I guess, I guess my final thought on it is, um, as a commissioner and as a commissioner, interpreting the guidelines, you know, the guidelines are so slow to change. If there are things that I feel like are clear or um, something that could be a positive 
that maybe the guidelines aren't quite caught up to. I feel like it's the duty as a commissioner to, um, to be flexible in that. I think we are still looking at things on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, we're not gonna just, you know, next case that comes and someone has a street facing, you know, we're not just gonna, you know. I think everything is very case-by-case -case and we're careful about that. Um, I think it's just a matter of, um, you know, if something is a little bit outdated in the guidelines, they are slow to change. I think we need to look at that. But that's my final thought. It sounds yeah. like we're ready for a. Yeah. And I just yeah. will note that you got to be careful between distinguishing a legislative body and a, a quasi judicial body. Mm. So I don't know that we're in the role of making the guidelines. Right. We're I don't think we are, but I think we are interpreting enforcing the guidelines. I think uh, Katie maybe outlined that. Let it go. Let go. Yeah. to the guidelines yeah. typically come That's from the commission. Uh, it can go to court and have to be able uh, to stand up and get it. The revisions to the guidelines come from the commission or from the public, um, asking that those revisions be made, but the but that's as a recommendation to the legislative body, which is council. So, so, so is that correct? Like you motion or you guys you would make the recommendation to the pro I was just, I'm just curious of that process, how that. So yeah, the HP commission plan. could work with, work with residents, work with neighborhoods to say, this is a specific area of the guidelines that needs to be revised. Here's what we think the guidelines should be for something like solar panels, um, solar shingles, and then forward that recommendation on to council. And then council would either adopt or not adopt those changes. To the city council? Yeah. Is that All right, it sounds like we've had a lot of discussion. Um, do we have a motion? Do we have a motion? My motion still stands. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I think we, we have a, a, a motion with, from Commissioner Poor, from Commissioner Poor to and deny. Yeah. To deny. Was, sorry, I had two people saying Either time. with or without prejudice. Remind me what she So with <laughs> means that they can't reapply um, for a year unless they have new information. Um, without prejudice means they can turn around and apply again tomorrow. I say without. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, motion by Commissioner Poor. Do we have a second? I, I'll second. Okay. Second. second by Commissioner Milner. <coughs> Please vote in PrimeGov. All right. So your uh, application is denied. Is that correct? Wait, yep. right. that's what he was a tie. No, it's four. That's, I'm looking at the wrong thing. I'm oh, counting yeah. that circle. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I appreciate it. Sorry. Yeah, thank Go you ahead. guys. And can I, yeah. <laughs> would it be best to just talk with you guys, communicate yeah. about like next steps, how it could yep. be helpful? Yep. Just give us a call. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or email, whatever. Thank you, guys. All right, uh, on to item 9, HPCA 22-00030. This is located at 2419 North Harvey Avenue, Jefferson Park, Ward 2. Consideration and possible action on application by Mark Crittenbrink, Crittenbrink Architecture for Brian Campa, Shield Equity Group. For certificate of appropriateness to one, remove rear dormer elective, two, construct rear dormer to convert attic space to two new apartments elective, three, construct exterior stairway elective, four, install door yes, opening in the gable end of the south facade elective, and five, infill windows on south, south end of the structure elective. So this is a proposal to remove a non-historic <coughs> dormer on the rear slope of the roof uh, and to install a larger shed dormer to make that attic space usable as two apartments within the uh, existing apartment building. As part of that conversion of the attic space, they also propose an exterior stair as the access point, which would require um, changes to the openings on that side of the building. Um, so this is at a corner property, the dormers on the rear, but would be visible from the side street and uh, staff did recommend approval with unique circumstances and conditions. All right, thank you, Katie. And it looks like we are missing, are we still at a quorum or do we need to? We have a quorum we're still. good, okay. You have a tie. Yeah. All right, good afternoon. Could you state your name and address, please? Sure, my name, 
Excuse me, my name is Mark Crittenbrink. I live at 428 West Eufaula. I'm with Crittenbrink Architecture. With me today also is Cody Douglas. He's also with Crittenbrink Architecture. And we are here representing the owners. I'm gonna give you a brief history on why we're here today. And then Cody, who is running the project, will be able to answer any questions that you might have. Um, the, the ownership sh ship group owned multiple properties in Oklahoma City. And in fact, when they bought this property, they bought the property to the south uh, and several to the, uh, to the north. Um, if you're familiar with this neighborhood, and I'm sure you are, uh, these are buildings that were built to be apartment buildings. They're not conversions or renovations. They are buildings that were built as apartment buildings. <clears throat> the, uh, the norm, which is what the buildings around them are, uh, are three-story buildings serviced by a central corridor, four apartments on the first floor, four, four apartments on the second floor, and then two apartments in the attic. So that's what the, um, this building, however, um, is the same formula except for the stair stops at the second floor and it's, it goes up, but it goes up to attic. The space is the same, it just wasn't built out the same as these other properties. So the owner felt, well, I can just you know, reestablish that stair and I can get that space up there and we're good to go. Um, they reached out to us and, and we thought, okay, fine. And then we, we reached out to the historic preservation uh, and they said, well, as long as you're not doing any, to anything to the outside, you're fine. Uh, and then we met with the city. Again, we're good. We can service this, this unit with the, uh, with the existing stair. And then we met with the fire department and they said, no, it, it got very curious, uh, not curious, but more difficult. Um, there's an ordinance in place now where we will have to sprinkler uh, the entire building. Additionally, the stair will have to be rebuilt uh, to meet current standards, which will mean A, rebuilding the stair, as well as going into an apartment on the first floor and the second floor and tearing out the kitchen and reworking it. That seemed extreme, so then we thought, well, what about if we did an exterior stair that access the attic and then we don't, you know, we can just close off uh, the opening from the second to the third floor. Uh, we had some initial conversations with, with Katie Friddle, uh, and uh, the owner wanted to do an enclosed stair. It's like, well, you're, you're not gonna get an enclosed stair. And we looked at all different options. And so what we came up with was an exterior steel stair, not, not a fire stair, but a steel stair, an ornamental steel stair that will access the, um, that will access the third floor. Um, I, again, uh, I met with Katie and we made some changes to how that looked. Uh, we had it up by the front part of the building and we were, you know, uh, Katie had said it needs to be not part of the front third of the building, so we moved it back to the back of the building. Um, and you can, the, you have the drawings on what the stair looks like. We do have to infill three windows um, in this process because of the fire rating with the stair. Um, and so that, that is our proposal and, and the dormer along the back. Uh, and that, that's just where we got where we are, so that you know. And then I will let Cody take over and answer any questions that you might have. All right, Thank I you. appreciate it. And it seems like, yeah, staff is recommending approval with a few um, specific findings, unique circumstances, and a couple conditions. Um, yeah, do we have any questions from commissioners? Um, I just have a quick question regarding parking. Um, if I'm assuming it's all off to code and everything, but I just always have concerns over how this affects like traffic patterns and where everybody parks and how crowded it gets. So are these two bedroom units, the apartments? These are single bedroom. Single bed, okay. Then it kind of seems like a non-issue. Yeah, they're about 500, 500 square feet a piece. Okay. Did you have any other comments? I have nothing. Do we have any comments from the public or? All right, I think it's pretty straightforward. Do you, um, let me look at these conditions real quick here. Okay, alternate door material. And that's consistent with the guidelines and yeah, I think that's really the main one. Something about the um, maybe compact stair, but if there was a way to make the stair more compact, is that correct? 
Yes, so yeah. staff wasn't sure if the stair design was dictated entirely by what was required to do by code, that, that, that it had to have that footprint, that it had to be that large, or if part of that was just wanting that space. That was correct, yes. It was strictly driven by code. The minimum possible, yeah. Bare minimum. <laughs> and and so yeah. I guess the second condition kind of doesn't, I guess we could drop that one, because um, it sounds like you've made it as, as minimal as you can. And then the first condition, um, are you, I guess, willing to work with staff on an alternate door material that's consistent with the guidelines? Do you know which specific door? So or? I think the door at the top of the stairs is proposed to be a steel door, um, and typically the guidelines support a wood, aluminum clad wood door within the historic structure. Um, and I'm assuming that the steel is proposed for you know a, a more secure door, but that's something the guidelines typically don't support, so. And that would be, I'm trying to see if that's even, that would be at the top of the stairs? Yes. So that would. And sorry, I'm, you yeah. guys have lots and lots of attachments on this one, so I'm trying know, to I'm find trying the to... ones that have the actual drawings in yeah. them for you, so I can tell you guys all what pages to look at if you haven't found those documents yet. Because um. my initial thought without even seeing your drawings is it, it sounds like it really <laughs> wouldn't be visible, maybe. So yeah, it, it, is, it is on a corner. It is on the rear slope of the roof, but it would be visible from the side street. Um, mm -hmm. And it, uh, it's set down the, where the gable or where the, where the dormer meets the roof is set down slightly below the peak of the gable, but it does occupy the majority okay. of the rear slope of the roof. Um, okay, so attachment. The last attachment, attachment five, is the one that has your site plan and your roof plan and elevations. If you guys have not yet found that, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see the stair, um, you can see the, the dormer. So it's, it is not, um, I wanna say, it's not an insignificant change to the property. It's going to be visible. Mm -hmm. um, it is a large addition. Staff felt like, I felt like it was, um, it retained the you can still read the form of the historic structure and of the historic roof itself, and that perhaps this was a more or a less impactful way to add livable space to the building without constructing an addition that changes the footprint, changes the massing of the building. Um, yeah, I agree. It's a, I think as minimal uh, uh, an improvement as you could make to to be able to build out those third floor units. But, I guess um, one comment okay. might, this might be helpful for the commission that, um, you know, the attic space was built similar to the other buildings to house apartments. It's the same space. It was just finished as an attic. Um, obviously, this is providing for a lot more space. Uh, if, I don't know if there was a driving force behind that just to make, accommodate larger units. Yes, they just wanted to utilize that space to pick up two extra tenants. I mean, it's all about cash flow, I guess, for them. Uh, and they own the property across the street and the, the building adjacent to the courtyard where the steps are going to be. So they basically own three buildings uh, in that same area. So they own the building here to the left uh, in that image and the building across the street to the north as well which the building to the north does have an attic that has been built out at some point. I don't know if it was original uh, or if it was built after it was constructed. Correct, that one. So it sounds like that's the one condition that's kind of a sticking point. Is that something you're open to working with staff on or do you want to um, argue for that? For, steel excuse door? me? For the steel door, do you, is oh, that something I, you want to argue for? I can concede to that. Yeah, okay. I mean, they make some really good wood doors now that will take the heat and the abuse of the south facing facade <laughs> that was the only thing that i was really concerned with is you know it is going to get a lot of heat and a lot of exposure uh and it would just it's going to take a beating so but i would concede to that yes okay that sounds good then do we have a motion on this side oh i'm sorry anyone from the public want to comment on this doesn't seem like it. All right, do we have a motion? I'll make a motion for HPCA 
dash zero 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 three zero um, for the items listed in the report with the unique circumstances and findings um, listed in the staff report and the one condition that the um, door material be more consistent with the guidelines and that he work with staff for that. All right, motion by Commissioner Poor. Do we have a second? I'll second. Who was that? I'm sorry. Me. Mm -hmm. Okay, Commissioner Jordan, second. Are we waiting on a vote or has there everyone voted? Here we go. I have Lainey. All right, your item passes. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, moving on to item 10, HPCA 22-00031. And I'll just mention also that uh, I previously worked for Common Works, but I do not anymore, and I did not work on this particular project, so I don't see any recuse. Uh, this is located at 2510 North Chartel Avenue, Paseo Ward 2, consideration of possible action on application by Asa Highsmith, Common Works Architects, for Micah McAllen, uh, M68 LLC, for certificate of appropriateness to one, remove retaining wall and basement entry at church elective. Two, remove existing curb, curb cut, parking lot, AC unit, bollards, and sidewalk elective. Three, install new sidewalks elective. Four, install back end angled parking on North Chartel elective. Five, install parking on east side of property elective. Six, install new curbs elective. Seven, construct apartment building elective. And eight, provide recommendation to the traffic commission regarding the installation of back end on street parking elective. Uh, this is a project that the Commission has reviewed previously as part of a um, request for an SPUD to rezone the property to allow for this development. It was previously, um, I don't remember actually if it was R1 or what the base zoning was, but it did not allow for this level of um, intensity of multifamily development. So the SPUD addresses things like lot coverage and setbacks and establishes a maximum height for the new structure. Um, it doesn't uh, dictate the design of the proposed structure, although renderings were included, um, conceptual renderings were included as part of the original proposal. Um, staff has recommended um, approval of most of the items. We did recommend a continuance of the removal of the retaining wall and basement entry at church, um, needing further documentation of what that would look like, particularly at the church itself, what would happen to that entry if it was enclosed or removed, um, and how that would be finished off, I suppose. Um, sorry, let me get my actual document, because this one has lots of pieces and parts um, before I start telling you what we recommended. Um, that on the building itself, staff's only real concern was that there were some architectural kind of details that weren't um, illustrated as uh, in full detail, things like what the eaves would be and kind of the window surrounds, those sorts of details that we would just want to capture in a certificate of appropriateness if approved. Um, um, I think some other considerations that were noted were the number of windows, um, kind of proportions of windows on, not on the primary facade, on the west facade, but on the rest of the building that windows were um, fairly minimal um, and then on the parkings uh, staff's only concern was that that installation of parking on Chartel reduces the yard space the lawn kind of in front of the front entrance to the historic church and whether or not that would be have an adverse effect on the character of that portion of the property um, I believe that summarizes the bulk of um, the staff recommendations, um, but we'll try to answer any questions that you all have. All right, thank you, Katie. All right, could you state your name and address, please? Uh, Asa Highsmith, uh, 435 Northwest 23rd, Suite 214. All right, and I'll open it up to my fellow commissioners. Do you have any comments? 
from his side. Did you, I'm, I'm not, on item one, um, did you provide documentation of the rear of the church with a drawing and a detail of how <laughs> appear after you? Uh, we, we have not yet. Um, we, we uh, you know, j just to be honest, this project uh, is really based on uh, still feasibility. Uh, we're, we're looking generically for approval of what we're trying to do so that we can ensure uh, a few things that would follow. One of those would be saving the church. Uh, you know, one of the reasons it's not part of this application just yet is in order to be able to afford to save the church as a developer, we need this structure, uh, uh, you know, really to, to bankroll that, you know, saving of the church. So um, partially, like, it, it's kind of a, you know, the, the issue with any of this type of design review is like, how far down the road do we go before, okay. You know, we push pause and try to get our right. approval. Okay. Um, we just haven't worked through it. Uh, totally happy to continue that as. as What's the reason? Just. Um, there's a couple of reasons. First off, uh, and this this is honestly a little bit of a temporary issue, but right now it's it, it's partially to secure the building. Uh, I'm sure if you've seen it, uh, the basement seems to be the primary entry for people that just like to go explore. Um, there's a lot, uh, that door's regularly fixed and then re-kicked in or re-broken through. Um, we see it as a little bit of a liability issue in that sense. We also see it as a liability long-term, and this is kind of our second reasoning, is that be becoming more of like a central pathway uh, that, that, you know, it's, it's a little bit our east-west main street between the two buildings. Um, you know, as a property owner, uh, any kind of fall or issue that might happen on the side, of course, is a big deal. Um, and so it was our desire to try to find a way to kind of, you know, mitigate those issues. Uh, we don't, in any future uh, that's going to be part of our development plan, uh, the basement will not see a major use uh, in the church. Any redevelopment of the church is almost certainly going to be, uh, you know, the ground floor almost really only uh we just don't see a viable use for the basement and any you know the plans that we have so so, so are you saying you'd, you'd create another opening somewhere else there's there's access from the interior of the building we don't know that we would provide an exterior opening at that point if we're approved so. i mean because there's just one is there just we just the one exterior one exit. Entry. would you have yeah. to have another exit if you uh, uh, went forward with some of your ideas uh, not per building code. We think we'll oh, okay. be fine uh, in terms of like code Just, implications. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah. The second would just be, I think the concern of of the parking on the street would be be feel like it's. I mean, there's a lot of things going on over there, but right. I mean to drive. You know, it's a it's a popular street. Mm -hmm. to drive up and down, and to have you know, the parallel parking or whatever, I mean, angled parking versus parallel parking on that street uh, seems a little different. And I mean, it, the, it I is, like the yeah. design. I think the design, I don't have any issues with the design of the thing. And in fact, I, it, it's nice, but it'll, the first floor will never really be seen because there'll be cars in front of it all the time. And if I could, if we could eliminate cars in one go, I'd be in. Right. I, I hate cars. I don't like driving. Right. I'm a walker for sure. I, I'm a primary bike rider. It's, a, it's the trouble of doing development period is the question that we still have to grapple with of where do the cars go. For us, uh, part of the reason we like the reverse angle back end parking or angled is that it, it's for urban reasons. It, it tends to slow traffic. At least all the data that we have or the metrics that I've seen on it uh, s says that it, it, it's almost, it, it's really the most beneficial thing for streets that you want right. to. I'm in agreement. They've tried it here. It hasn't, hadn't worked so far, but. Uh, right. Uh, uh, we've we've experimented with well. it here, but yeah, it's never like really stuck. Right. Um, and we're, we're experimenting again. We're, because you're we're giving asking, another go, I guess. Uh, it, that's also part of this. You're asking us to recommend that <laughs> as a yeah. part of. It. So, I mean, that, that's just my, I mean, the project looks interesting, and your designs are, I think, follow the guidelines. I just the the idea of, of um, uh, you know, having the cars in front of it 
Is, was there no way to do a, because you all talked about different things, including the alley, did you ever get that part of it figured out as far as being able to use it or um, it's not anybody's? Or there, there's still a lack of like complete clarity there. I know that it's, it's closed but not vacated, I think, or vacated but not closed, whichever right. the, yeah, okay. Uh, so, it, but, that doesn't mean that we can use it for parking. It's no, still only really like a path to if, our parking. Right, yeah. if you had that, could you put all the par push the building further to the front and put all the parking in the rear? The, the difficulty with that is that if we move any further on our lot, we'll be in front of the existing church. And to me, I worried that that was more of a hard line for, for HP than the parking. I don't know, I, you tell me. I, I don't know. For me, it wouldn't be because if it eliminated parking in front and made it more of a friendly neighborhood kind of walk, For sure. I, I would be interested in that because I, and I know that, that I, I was just wondering, was there something in the, uh, was there any other reasons uh, due to codes or anything that you had to push it? It, it? Honestly, it was purely because we were trying to not because, be in front of the church. I mean, maybe you could. I don't know. My idea would be maybe that you then that maybe offers an opportunity for like a courtyard type thing in front of the church. You push it up. And I'd, be, have I'd be all for that. that. But I, you know. Well, I, don't know, that's, is I just wanted to kind of explore your parking and, sure. and why. I mean, I, 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 the design, but, and that's really all my questions. I just, I think uh, it would be so nice to drive by, like downtown buildings, the new developments where they're close to the sidewalk and, you know, it, it kind of feels like they're part of it instead of like a uh, yeah. old style to apartments with uh, cars in front. So. Actual total agreement. Those uh, are my it's comments. It's just our, this was our way of trying to navigate those two issues, and you know it's kind of in between. Yeah, you can Thank only you. work with what you have. Right. Um, I I have a question just regarding the back end parking because I yeah. have lived in places that have attempted this and it has not worked. Um, it's still there, but it's still not working. What is mm -hmm. your yeah. What is the, um, what's your reasoning for wanting the back end parking? It, it's, it's legitimately, it's an urbanist, urbanist. approach. Yes, it's an attempt. I'm familiar with it, it but we, we, we think, we feel like the, the issue that it's not working is, is purely literacy. We feel like in Oklahoma City, because there's a lack of it, it's only in very targeted specific areas, there's just not enough literacy. Uh, among Oklahoma City drivers. It's just like a roundabouts. We feel like yes. roundabouts have gained momentum because yes. people have started to realize that they do something better than a four-way stop in a lot of, you know, a lot of ways or like, you know, other stop types. Uh, we feel like that's the truth behind reverse angle back in. Um, you know, it, it's only ever going to become common and people understand it if we do more of it. And so that's that was kind of our thinking. Uh, we so. totally recognize it's still yeah, uh, uncommon, I, um, but Chartel is a major bike path, um, and so with reverse angle parking, it's a lot safer um, than somebody backing up with a possible bicycle coming. So they would be they would back up as they like park, but they're at the right angle to be able to see the the bikes coming, and then they would pull straight forward. Yeah, no, I'm super familiar so, with the concept. Yeah. Um, I just and with other relevant. Um, what's the right term I'm looking for, like topography and urban traffic patterns. Um, I, I get it, I'm familiar with a lot of the things they're trying, um, but I do feel like every time I see it, it what is not safe is the um, chaos of people not knowing how to use it. And that's what I'm, sure. if it is just, and I am with you that like it has to start somewhere and I applaud the, the attempt at it. I just, it always feels chaotic and messy to me when I see it and it kind of feels contributing towards bad traffic patterns on 23rd Street right there too. I kind of wonder, well, oh. Please go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, you know, just thinking about this, I, I, I agree with you for sure. I think if you're used to, you know, pulling in and all of a sudden you see a reverse, like, oh my God, am I going wrong way? <laughs> you know, or there's some confusion maybe. Um, but you know, this is like retail or anything. These are these are residences, so I feel like that's a good point. You know, They're it's like that's it. your home, so you, you figure it out after the first day or two, and then it's like you know, that's just your parking spot. I mean, sure, you might have a visitor here and there, but you might tell like if your friend's gonna come visit, and they park on the street or something. You might yeah. you know, I could imagine you're like, hey, by the way, the parking's weird. Yeah, no, that's a really <laughs> valid point. I appreciate you pointing it out because uh, the the places that I was citing were mixed use uh, residential and. Yeah 
retail, so that is quite a bit different. But the other thing I, I wanted to bring up real quick too, on uh, I think Mary Jo was mentioning this, it would be interesting to look at, you know, maybe some other parking options. I think on street, you know, it's something that, um, you know, let's say 20 years from now, everyone has uh, some kind of self-driving taxi or something and no one owns cars, you know. That would be something easy that you could turn into like a nice landscape front yard and, and the buildings where it is. But I guess my question is more of a technical one regarding the spud that you guys got. Did you build in those kind of setbacks or is it built into the spud that it says it has to be, you know, even with the, and that might have been because it came here as well. So that might have been like a preemptive. Uh, it, it's almost certainly part of the spud language. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. Um, yeah. So I actually believe the spud allowed for the church or the apartment building to sit farther forward than you have it to line up with the houses to the south of you. Um, that's the discussion I remember having with Mark Zitzow about it, that he said, if we, have, if we can't get the on-street parking, the SPUD will allow us to come forward. We'll still be in line with the building to the south. We'll just be forward of the church, but we could get more parking behind the church. So there I'd have go. to yeah. check the math on that to see if that's actually where everything lined up based on what you've got. But that was the discussion a few months ago. But that being said, with the parking right now, you're using the street and the alley as a circulation space. You can kind of maximize parking off this side, it seems like. So if you had to, like, add drive or I don't know. I guess that'd be a design problem for the applicant. But um. So and, and let me offer some, some anecdotal information just for context of this specific site. So, uh, so Chartel is a, a vehicular thoroughfare, is not a particularly strong pedestrian thoroughfare. You, you have basically three blocks up from 23rd Street before you hit the cemetery. Um, the sidewalks as you move north are spotty or gone yeah, in sections. Severely. I run through there every day. The uh, 25th is the east-west there, so if you drive on 25th at any point in time, it is lined with parallel parked cars. So having um, vehicles in front of the building is not out of context. Um, it is out of context on Chartel because of its uh, speed, but um, I don't think having uh, parking in front of it is detrimental to the existing context. Yeah, no, I agree completely. I mean, I'm with you. I wish cars didn't exist in any sort of architectural <laughs> relevancy, but they do, and it doesn't seem like there's another option for parking, is there, as of yet, unless, um, to, you know, if Joe's suggestion were um, we paintable, but... Right, I, I think, you know, we, a big part of it, I'm glad Cassie brought it up because I forgot about my point on this, was, was the, the, uh, the planned bike infrastructure for Chartel. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually the original impetus for us looking at this option, uh, was trying to figure out a way to navigate, you know, the fact that we will have a bike lane there and what do we think would be safest, uh, you know, in that context and work for our development. Um, uh, How many so parking spots is it? I'm sorry if it's, oh, they're on here. Nine. I mean, yeah, nine, nine total. I mean, I ride also, and I mean, going behind, I mean, it's one thing to go down a line of cars that's parked parallel. It's an unknown to drive behind. You, you basically aren't in the bike lane at that point. You have to move over to the lane. I mean, there in, is no in this bike. situation, right. well, we feel like with the with the back end reverse angle, right? right. Not with your. You have to usually, face the right. You're pulling out facing the bike right. lane. So I, just I agree. Like if you're, you're going to yeah, have yeah. it, it would it okay. would be better that way because the other way with bikes, you right. don't know what's coming at yeah, you. You have yeah, to move yeah. over into the lane. There right. is no. Yeah, break. that'd be pretty scary. So, uh, so that, I'll just reiterate, sorry, Katie. I was just gonna say on the setback, the SPUD actually allows the setback on Chartel to be five feet, which is consistent with the properties to the south of it, okay. even though that, the church is go. set much farther back off Chartel. Right. So. so I think it's a great design. I'm happy to see it. Um, I don't see any issues uh, either solution. Right? I do have a question about the church. Sure. Um, is that, is there still feasibility on saving that church? Is that conversation happening? I mean, that's our plan. To our plan is to save the church. Okay. Now, it, it's not. It's almost certainly not going to be a church use. Sure. Um, it, I think if somebody was okay. going to reuse that as a church, it would have been saved a long time ago. Yeah, absolutely. We feel like with the decline, honestly, and and just church going, yeah. uh, period, uh, the the likely use for this is adaptive reuse, and our plan is to absolutely make 
uh, additional units out of them okay. right now. Okay. Um, uh, again, a lot of that hinges on our approval for the new building. Uh, I, th I think without this, we just can't make the numbers work on on the, the existing church. But, but that that's would all our plan. come back yeah. to us again. We'll, we'll, so. we'll be back. I mean, you know, assuming we get uh, some kind of approval today, we'll be back probably at, at the next meeting or as soon as we can get through uh, with the church. Okay. We've, just got, we, we've still got work to do on that side. So are you comfortable with all of the conditions listed? Uh, yeah, I think we are. Um, I read through them. I, I don't know if there's anything in particular that I should make sure and talk about up here. So, well, so a couple of things to, to make sure the commission has kind of looked at and contemplated. We've talked about the on-street parking. I think everyone um, understands the, the situation with that. Um, one of the things that we've talked about with the applicant is that they're not 100% certain on how they're going to address the grade of the site. When you look at that site, it slopes gradually across the property. The intention is to respond to that grade change with the structure that you may end up with the unit at one end having no stairs up to the entry, the unit at another end has a couple of stairs coming up um, and not to go the alternate route of having a massive retaining wall that surrounds one end of the property, but that any final adjustments to the project to respond to the grade of the site would come back to staff um, to either include in the final CA to be issued or as a revision to the CA, depending on how the timing of that works out. So I think the commission needs to address that if you want that to be a condition that it's submitted as part of this approval or if that's something that could be addressed later on as a revision to the CA. Um, but I just wanted the commission to be aware that that's something that is very likely going to change about the design as they kind of move toward actual construction drawings. Um, we had some findings about um, the north and south elevations of the buildings uh, having larger expanses of blank wall surface that are gonna be visible from, from the north, from the south. So if the commission has any comments on that, if you feel like the design on those, um, and then as well, you know, the east is not as visible from the street, but obviously it's gonna be visible from neighboring properties. So if you all had any further comments on that, or if you felt like there were no issues there, and then I think the final thing was just some architectural details that weren't um, fully illustrated in the drawings that would just be something that could be submitted to staff um, as a condition of the approval if you all are comfortable with that. And those were fairly um, minor things, but just things that we would want captured in the approval documents. I'm, I'm also happy to quickly speak to each of those if, if the commission would like. Um, it's definitely our it's intent. It's the ones you don't agree with. <laughs> well, we actually agree with everything. Um, we, we, it's our intent, and I, I think we're in agreement, uh, for the grade change to absolutely try to manage that with the building's design. I'm not a big fan of coming in and just trying to make a site flat uh, in order to do a, you know, new, a new structure. Um, is it easier to do that? Generally, yes, but uh, I think especially in, in you know, urban context, it's, it's much more interesting. Uh, I think it adds to the character of the neighborhood and, and provides quite a bit of positive back to allow a building's you know, floor level to shift as the grade shifts. Um, I think that's how we used to do it, and I think there's, it just makes more sense uh, for us. Um, the second item was that you brought up, Katie, um, I'm sorry. Oh, the, the facades, yep. the, the north and south facades. We, we agree, we, you know, this is a, like I said, this is kind of a, uh, an interim step for us. I'll totally admit that we need to keep working on our facades and rebalancing. You know, it's, we're not fully happy with it yet, but it's kind of where we were for pencils down for today's meeting. Um, those are gonna improve vastly, and we feel at least very confident in our ability to, to make a really nice facade. So we think you guys will be happy with our end product. Um, but yeah, we, we got a little bit of work to do on, I think, the north and south facades. Um, and on any of the detailing, of course, we'll work with staff and do whatever they, do whatever they need of us, so. 
So it sounds like um, there are some items here, like the definitely the recommendation probably to traffic commission. That's something that I'm sure you're wanting to move forward with. Um, let me look at the staff report here. It sounds like you're mentioning maybe making some adjustments to the openings and things like that. Is, is that something that we would want to see? The opening? Um, if, if, there, if the applicant is going to make changes to the facade and the openings? Um, that I'm, is something that I'm we, comfortable with yeah. working with staff yeah. personally. Okay. I don't think it's a major change. Unless staff said it's some, yeah. something comes forward. And well, we can rely on staff to determine what that right. is. Yeah, I think so. if something comes in that's dramatically different and is not consistent but with what you all have approved, we would send it back through the commission to, mm -hmm. for you all to see again. But All right, so it sounds like the applicant is agreeable to all the conditions and sounds like we've discussed it. Any other comments from the commission? Any comments from the public? <laughs> all right, do we have a motion? Um, just sorry to interrupt again, <laughs> start talking before you guys, but we do have um, one item that's recommended to be continued that I think the applicant was comfortable with to get further clarification on the retaining wall and basement entry. Everything else is oh, recommended for yeah. approval with um, conditions that have been agreed to, and then it would be a separate, so it would be one vote for the continuance, one vote for the approvals, and then a vote to recommend approval to the traffic commission and you all may want to look at those findings and conditions just based on the discussion that was had about the on-street parking. And that continuance what the, on the... What oh, would be the continuance? That was the retaining of that, uh, that basement the, opening, and that, which we discussed that. It sounded like there was maybe I, a consensus on that, but I don't know. I don't... I don't right. know if you all wanted to see what, since that was actually I, on the I, I felt like my, structure. I felt like it was answered. Is it to your benefit mm -hmm. for it to be approved today or is it kind of irrelevant? Um, I mean, yeah, it'll make our life easier okay. if it's approved, but at the same time. That would be the one know. item that they would, you know. I, I think, think that they. They're gonna have to come back for the church anyway was my question. Like, is it to your benefit with the. True. Well, you're that approved, but to go forward, yeah. but you would still have to come back and show exactly how you intended to fill it in. Well, it's a good point that it's, you know, technically it, it probably makes more sense to be with our church application anyway. Um, I think we, we included it here because staff pointed out that our site plan kind of like ignored the fact that it existed. <laughs> um, mm, uh, gotcha. and, and, and it's part of our overall plan, but, you know, if, if, if how we handle that makes more sense being part of that application, I don't see why that I think is It kind of doesn't matter either way, right? And I guess, I guess it is a, maybe a security issue. Is something so well, maybe that's something that you term, would address in the know? short term it's just been yeah it's just been a, a headache right uh, but um you know our long-term solution again happy to bring to you guys whatever you need i mean i'm staff, happy that we yeah. yeah staff just wanted to have understanding and agreement on how it was going to be done because you've got a wood door and presumably you're going to fill those stairs in with concrete well that would or, be you know and then what's it going to look like where the door I mean, was and now it's gone can you get to the basement from the church yeah, from the from interior inside. of the church. So not, not from out. This is the only entry from the outside to the from, basement. To the basement. To but the you basement. can go to the basement from the inside yes. of the church. Yeah. You don't think there'd ever be an instance where you would want to deliver items or something into the basement? Our, our long-term plan right now would be that actually the basement would be storage for tenants. Um, okay. uh, I've lived in similar apartments actually in, in Midtown where, you know, they, they had to repurpose an old basement, and they basically did like little lockers, little yeah, places for people to keep extra stuff. That's our plan. We we don't see um, a big need for exterior access to that. Yep. I mean, for ease, I I would prefer it packaged with the church, but I'm also I I'm agree. okay with whatever everybody else I, thinks. I agree. Um, would that mean oh, would, would the applicant just... withdraw that item, or how how would that work? Um, at this point, we could just continue it, continue. and then depending on the timing of when the church comes in, if that's something that gets added to this application um, as a, another kind of item, then we can put the basement back on, or, but we can work, if you guys want to just continue it today, and then we can work through how we... Also, just for your timeline for the CA, for anything regarding the church, would all be on the same um, CA? The... Both buildings, is that what you're saying, or are you saying Well, that? I mean, if we remove this, um, 
you know, there's only one item that's directly related to the church right. on this. And so if we removed it and packaged it with your next submission that has, or whenever, if it's in the next meeting or the one after that, um, everything else with the church, you would have the same timeline on your CA and but you wouldn't run into an issue where this was going to expire. Is the church going to be included on this application? I don't know. Or do you think we, you'll we saw them as two separate okay. permits? I don't know. I'm always thinking in, ter in terms of plan review and probably like cleaner to thing. have two separate. Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of what we were thinking yeah. from the beginning. Okay. That's why we approached it that way. But okay. yeah, because we don't have anything on that. I mean, it was submitted without those items anyway. So I need mm -hmm. to know how that. Would, anyway, yeah. All right. So that sounds kind of clear. Maybe so we have a motion. <laughs> happy to continue that, and we will make it a part of our church submission. Right. Okay. I, okay, so you're good to continue that, that portion. That works for everybody. And yeah. then, okay. Would you like it um, yeah. moved to the May meeting or the June meeting? Is it? Let's continue it to June so that we don't have to write a staff report and put it on the agenda if it's going to ultimately come in as part of a separate application. And then we'll the, work with the applicant on, on how mm -hmm. we handle that. Okay. Yeah. Really, this approval lets us, like, gives us the confidence to move forward with the design work. And uh, with that being the case, we've got a little bit of a wall anyway where we've got to you know, we got other things to do, so it's it's no harm for me to get that put together and bring it to June. Okay. At that um, well, then I will motion to continue item one of HBCA 22-00031 to the June 1st meeting of the commission with the specific findings referenced in the staff report. All, All right. second. Motion by Commissioner Jordan, uh, second by Commissioner Milner. Please vote in time code. All right, that motion passes. Do we have another motion? I'm gonna have to wait until I can see my screen again to look at all of it. And the traffic part, that's a recommendation, not a um, motion, right? I'm not sure how we mm -hmm. technically call we'll it. it. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve items, uh, mm -hmm. item two and item seven. Is that all of them? Mm -hmm. I think you can do two, two three, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay. So I, I make a motion to approve HPCA 22-00031, items two through seven, with the specific findings and conditions as noted in the staff report. Do we need to just amend that to be the first condition since we discussed the parking? We didn't request any changes to the parking? I think you can leave it because it just okay. says if requested. Okay. And you um, then I'll second. All right. So we've got a motion by Commissioner Remy and a second by Commissioner Jordan. And that item passes. And for the recommendation, I think that's all that's left, right? So this is a motion, but it's a motion to forward a recommendation to the traffic commission. So, but did they decide the motion was I was out probably? Did they decide what they want to recommend? So, uh, we, the staff report says to recommend <coughs> approval with conditions to the traffic commission. Um, it lists specific findings. And then the condition was that any modification to the on street parking as directed by the HP commission be incorporated into the <coughs> final design. I think you could. Based on the discussion, it sounds like we could strike the condition. So it would just be a recommendation to approve to the traffic commission. And then if those findings all seem applicable. I will make a motion to recommend approval to the traffic commission with the specific findings listed on the staff report. I think all of those are okay. And I'll second. All right. Uh, motion by Commissioner Poor and second by Commissioner Milner. Please vote. Milner. <coughs> Drummers. Mine's not showing, but I vote it, uh, yay. Hmm. 
All right, and you are approved. Appreciate okay. it. Okay, thank you so much. All right, item 11, HPCA 2200032. This is located at 1001 Northwest 38, believe, Crown Heights, Ward 2. Consideration and ap on possible action yeah, on application by Holly Hunt. Naked, uh, uh, sorry. Consideration and possible action on application by Holly Hunt, Sam Gresham Architecture for Garrett and Julia Klingensmith for certificate of appropriateness to one construct second story addition elective. So this is a proposal to add a second story to an existing house. It doesn't expand the footprint of the structure at all. Um, it just kind of builds out from the attic and then extends beyond that. Um, staff did recommend continuance, um, primarily because as proposed, it exceeds the um, square footage allowed for additions to historic structures. Um, other concerns were um, replacing the um, vent in the gable at the attic on the front of the house with a window. Uh, the guidelines generally do not support adding windows um, on the front elevation. Um, I think those were the, the main concerns, but i um, happy to try to answer questions if you guys have any. All right, thank you, Katie. Uh, I guess maybe say your name again and your address. For the record? Uh, Holly Hunt, Northwest 23rd, or 400. Okay. <laughs> Let's try again. We're Holly Hunt, 400 Northwest 23rd Street, um, Sam Gresham Architecture. Uh, and I think Katie introduced it perfectly. When I read through the staff report, it really just appears that the size oh, is the biggest concern. Um, and so I, you know, I looked through this. Um, I would say that that given the house and the style of the house, really this. This addition suits the size and configuration of the house. I think if you look at the, the roof plan, we've taken great care to stay behind the main facade. So again, in every way, we step in from both the east and west facades uh, before we create the addition as a way to minimize visibility from the front. Um, you can see that as well on the elevations. Um, and I wanted, so let's talk about the size when I do 884, which is our square foot addition, and sorry, I didn't realize we could only use the historic footprint, but even that at 1541, which is the historic footprint, we're at 57%. I think it says in the staff report 75%, but that's, that's just a simple calculation, I think, error. But uh, so we're about 7% over, I guess, what is 50% of the historic structure. So um, as an example, I brought, and I brought a copy for everyone. These are not new drawings, but I just wanted to point mm -hmm. out. So the main thing I, and, and once you get these, so um, I was able to provide today um, uh, on the second page of the attached, um, an example of an addition that's at the 770 square foot. Um, we basically just remove some of the finished attic space. So I just wanted to show that really we can get to that 770 um, and it's the same type of footprint, I guess, if you will, from the roof. Um, so it's certainly something we can do, but I just wanted it to be clear that the, the, that 7% difference is really just a matter of finishing out portions of the existing attic. Um, as you see on this style of architecture, they would use a really steep pitch at the front of the house. And that, of course, is in the Tudor st revival style. Um, but then quickly, almost immediately, uh, going to a much lower pitch in the rear is a more economical way to frame and cover the rear of the house. So. I bring that up is to say that this addition is taking great care in maintaining that historic steep pitched roof in the front and, and the sides even, as well as the step back, which is historically found in, in this style of architecture. So, you know, I'm kind of laughing because you yeah. know, sometimes you come and it's like, uh, you know, you have a lot of applications here and it's like, oh no, the square footage is too big again and how are we gonna, but it does seem, just looking at the plans that you passed out, um, it is a pretty compact addition. It looks like it's kind of 
it's uh, more or less the footprint of that original house. And if I'm hearing you correctly, some of that square footage that is over is existing kind of attic space that's encapsulated into that uh, square footage, right? Most certainly, so. yes. So I'm giving you the total of finished condition new space, but you know it's hard to give an exact since so much of that is already under roof, right. as Klaus just pointed out. I'm, I am, I guess, sympathetic to that because you're not really adding the, you know, proportionally to the mass of the house that you would with the square footage. It's just you're making use of what's already underneath the roof for part of it. So, um, I guess personally, I'm, you know, I could be sympathetic to that argument. Yeah, so. I agree. Holly, where's the, just for, to point out, upstairs, the window that you all are wanting to change? Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that. So, just tell me where it is in the upstairs. Well, I know it's in the attic vent, but on the floor plan. In the monster closet that tunnels off oh. of the addition. Okay. So, we've That's got a thought. really steep pitch there. Right. So, we could utilize some of that space for a closet. I mean, I'm, I'm with the others. I don't think really that that's an addition. Are you counting that in your agent? I am counting it in my calculation. Um, so, just to be I mean, what you, so are you, did you do a calculation of what you could deduct if you were just, if you were not including using the existing? Uh, well, I think that was a point of the exhibit. And okay. a, like a storage closet that is all, all under the existing attic space. So I was just, as an exercise to show how little of difference it would be in order to get within that 50% of the historic footprint. And it's still a gray area because it's finished, finishing out some attic space. So, so are you, just for clarification, are you saying that if we, if you deduct the uh, outside storage, the master closet portion of the sauna that you're under 750? Yes. Well, we're at the 50% of the historic footprint, so. Or 750, yes. whichever yes, is. Yes, you're correct. It, we're a little more than that. It, we're okay. allowed, 50% of our historic footprint would be 770 square feet. Well, I, I think you take out your stairs. It's already there. You only oh, get you're to right. count it once. I did calculate. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have calculated the stairs, I, and I certainly most certainly did. Um, I mean, to me, it sounds like <laughs> on, it sounds like the square footage isn't really a, Close. an issue. I think you can torture yeah. the numbers. Yeah. Um, sorry. Correct. Well, Honestly, I, I, I guess I'm... Back as un dishonest or something. Yeah, I think as far as additions are concerned, this is probably one of the less, uh, I, don't, I don't know, impactful maybe additions. Because um, I, I don't think it'll be very visible. Like you, okay. you know, you got the seat pitch groups and you know, you're encompassing mostly just existing, you know, attic space and adding some, you know, so. You know, you've got pretty consistent window patterns, I think, if I'm looking at it. I, I guess I personally don't really see a lot of issue with this. Um, so, Holly, are you, um, I'll call it a mansard, but what's, what's the pitch of the mansard? Are you matching the pitch of the steep roof? That's correct, matching it exactly. It's 12-12. Okay. Or well, it's listed, I shouldn't, don't catch me lying. 12, it's on 12, the- 12-18. It looks like. 18, 12. You're correct. Very steep. Yes. Yeah, that's steep. Okay. Because I think that's the, for, for an addition like this, I don't think it impacts the mass or, or negatively impacts the characters. Just how does it stitch in and tie in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were hoping to just nestle it in, you know, just right behind the historic fabric as best we could. I don't know if I have any other comments. Does anyone else have any additional comments? And, and just really quick, since staff brought it up, in regard to swapping out the vent for the a window, uh, our thoughts here, we, we do have on the original house some beautiful transom glass that, that's in like that kind of elongated arch that we see a lot in this style. And it's got some beautiful stained glass. It, or I don't know that it's called stained glass. It's like that marbled brown and white type glass and it has diagonal patterning. Um, so, you know, we just thought we would incorporate something like that, a replication of a window like that there as a way to get light into the finished attic space, which will be a closet. Again, 
not for visibility's purpose, but just, again, a nice feature and uh, replicating some historic fabric. Um, that was the intent. We would nestle that right inside that rough opening that's created. It's a great picture of it. Um, you know, none of the cast seal or the brick uh, roll lock along the top or sides would be affected. Um, in fact, we could probably leave that little piece of wood trim as, as a jam to attach our new window to. Um, and of course, uh, you know, upon approval, I can provide staff with full cut sheets of everything. You know, I just, we haven't ordered or bothered getting a signage company to take off until we were a little more certain about how the commission felt. This maybe seems a little bit like replacing a window. I don't know how you guys, I mean, I'm not sure about the, um, I mean, do you know, is that an original vent or was there some other window there at some point? I or? assume it was always an attic vent mm -hmm. due to the fact that this is not a finished attic space and it does serve the function of being mm -hmm. an attic. Um, since that will no longer be its purpose and it now will be finished space, we thought that would be a modest way, again, to do something historic and, and lovely without really changing the view from the street to... Actually, here's a little bit of a, I guess, a, a thought. If you're going to build out this space to be a living space, it's not going to be an attic anymore. It really wouldn't function as a vent. You're not going to just have it open. That's that correct. So you're going to close, close it off, off anyway, right? That's correct. So, I don't know. I'm kind of... I would just do it in a way not to call attention to it. That would be my only suggestion. Don't make it too fancy? Right. Okay. I would make it less fancy. That would Certainly. So just a clear like a window, glass like with a, maybe a, the grid pattern that matches the regular windows. I could see it just like a, if it was just Diagonal a pane of glass, clear glass with a, you know, and it just I mean, fits in there. Clear glass will read dark during the day. So it'll read like that there. Whereas if you enter just color, you're going to call attention to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you, is Modest that uh, window would be acceptable okay. for you, do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, yep. yeah okay. I, think, I think the idea here is to bring in some light to an otherwise dark space. Sounds good. Do we have any other comments then? Or any um, comments from the public? Next slide. Come on up here if you'd like to speak. You're fine. Hi, I'm Julia. Just wait, wait. Just, you'll have to yeah, say. Yeah, could you state your uh, <laughs> name and really address? Hanging out. Uh, it's downtown. Yeah, go ahead and see. Um, hello, Julia Klingensmith. Um, I live at this house. But there are, uh, I've noticed through the neighborhood, there's a number of houses that have kind of like leaded diamond glass. And there's even one, I think, three houses over that they did convert the attic. And they've got, they've got a diamond shape, what used to be a vent instead of the rounded one. But they have basically kind of a diamond pattern of clear glass. I thought that could be probably something easy to do that tied into what is throughout the neighborhood uh, without necessarily looking too modern because you don't necessarily see. I've been looking at all, all of these vent windows when I drive around Heritage or Mesta or any of the places. And I any ones that is just like flat glass kind of looks like something modern that's been added. Um, so I thought something that looks like consistent with the other windows that are historic to the neighborhood would probably look the best. Obviously, flat glass will be cheaper for me, so I guess that's a win, but I don't mind spending money if it ends up looking better. I mean, this is one of those things you could argue both ways. Maybe you could say, well, the flat glass would, you could tell it's not historical because it wasn't a window. Maybe you know it's been replaced, or, you know, I, yeah. Is it, do we have measurements on how inset it is, the, the existing opening? Like how? You mean inset from the brick face? Yeah, yeah it's about five inches. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so pretty deep for a yeah. window. Um, I mean, to that end, I think David may be correct that, you know, during most hours it would not look very different than it currently does. Um, Shadow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be offended by leaded glass pattern, but maybe that's... I wouldn't be offended. I wouldn't be offended by anything that's not incredibly flashy. <laughs> Um, it is kind of a secondary, it's not like a big main window or something, it is kind of a secondary feature on the facade. Um, that's correct, it's just 18 inches wide, so it's yeah. pretty narrow, and that's the whole opening, so of course the glass would be much less. I guess the big, the, the main thing for me is the fact that it's a vent now, and if you're going to build out the attic, it will no longer function as a vent, so it's like, you know, I don't know More if it authentic. makes sense to keep the vent, you know, just to maintain the appearance at that point. Um, I think it's one of those compromises to make it more usable, you know. So, I, whether it's a flat window or, a, 
I don't know, I, I maybe, maybe I'm kind of in the opinion that a simple one would be nice, just because I think it would read the exact same as it does now, but I think so that's. So I'll just note that earlier in the meeting, we told another applicant that they couldn't have stained glass um, unless they had evidence of historic stained glass on their house, and that's typically our, our message. Mm. We're typically very, um, we typically discourage any sort of you know new features on the front of a structure that weren't there historically. So. I think the discussion about just plain glass that's recessed in the opening, it's gonna be in the shadow anyway. It's gonna be difficult to tell. Um, of course, I'm gonna advocate for it. it needs to stay a vent because the guidelines say it should stay a vent. Mm -hmm. um, but if the commission's going in the direction of the window, um, staff would certainly just encourage the consistency on how we've treated the introduction of leaded glass, stained glass, et cetera, where it didn't exist historically. So, I think that's a so fair argument. So perhaps the compromise yeah. would just be the grid pattern in a diagonal diamond, such as what we see in the main house, but just do clear glass. Well, yeah. To be fact, clear, leaded glass is not stained glass. Correct. Leaded glass correct. is the. That's pattern. right. Yes. So. Can I just um, just to start from scratch here? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there opposition to from the street view leaving it a vent, a non-functioning vent? I mean, is that? Uh, I mean, I think desirable. it wouldn't change anything on the facade, so I don't think there's, you know, I guess uh, there would be any opposition to that if they just want to leave Not it from us, from them. Oh, gotcha. I, I think they would much rather have a window, yes. Just, again, for the light, now it's a finished space. There is an opening there, so that was kind of the thinking. It would be a good opportunity. Um, but I think we are amenable to what staff feels is appropriate by way of the window itself and its makeup, um, whatever the guidelines deems appropriate uh, in, in the historic fabric, I think that's what we'll go with. We'd be happy to do that. I mean, I'd almost just argue if the applicant is amenable to just having it, you know, a, a simple window that I think would almost read the same as events do now, I think that might be the least painful, but. Easily approvable, maybe. All right. So, any any other comments or oh? Um, you've indicated a plain window, and Holly's talking about articul articulation of that window. Sure. So, are you talking plain flat glass when you're asking for? that determination or are you amenable to articulation as well? We have lots of windows within the district similar in shape to this mm -hmm. that previously replaced vents. These mostly are not historic windows when they're this small, mm -hmm. um, but the guidelines currently say plain clear glass, no leaded glass, no stained glass. It doesn't necessarily address articulation. And I don't want to leave with the impression sure. of no inter articulation when. My recommendation was basically like what they got, you know, just um, plain, clear mm -hmm. glass without any, you know, not leaded or anything, just a. Uh, I think that's glass. great. No divided light. Yeah. I no think the window light. unit's too small mm -hmm. to get yeah. a divided light. Sure. It's almost the same size as the little openings on either side of the door. So it is kind of bigger than you think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's narrower. And, and she's saying it's 18 inches. So if it's 18 inches wide, it's like 36 inches tall. Well, she's counting the wood, but that's like, you can't really see. That's the rough oak, it's like brick big. to brick. Width. Brick to brick. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's really pretty big. I mean, it would be nice to get the light on the inside, I will say, right. just from a practical living standpoint. But. That's not really our. Uh, I, th I think we, we love the idea of just doing a plain glass uh, up there, just not draw any attention to it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a great okay. compromise for us. Sounds good. Do we have any further comments? And no comments from the public. Do we have a motion? I make a motion. I make a motion to approve HPCA 2200032 with the specific findings. Let's see if they all apply. Um, 
the specific findings as noted in the staff report, and I'm going to add unique, unique circumstances for number six, that where it says that the proposed 884 square feet is in excess under, uh, that would be, it's only item one. Uh, a unique circumstance would be that the majority of the uh, majority of the square feet over 750 is already located in the existing attic and is the yeah is located in the existing attic. Um, we didn't discuss the windows. Did you have any comments? or Katie on the 30% forward. Let me refresh my memory of what that The proposed vert vertical addition requires new window openings forward of the back 30%. So I think that's just that because the addition is sitting on top of the historic structure oh, okay. rather than being behind it's it, a little different. we're introducing new windows that are toward the front of the structure. Okay. Um, So percentage-wise, where are you? That's about like Holly, can you come up and talk into the mic? Sorry. I'm sorry. I know that. Um, well, the total depth is 62 feet. So where would that fall? What was that, like 30, what third, 33 percent back? And you're at 20? Yeah, 20 foot back on the east side, the first window begins, and then the first window on the west side starts at 18 foot. So. And that 18 foot is about a third of the total depth. Katie, do we need any more information on that or do we just need to leave it as is? I think if the commission's comfortable with the design as proposed, you okay. can just leave that finding as is. Um, and proposes replacement. Uh, and change number 11 to that additional work in the attic proposes replacement of the louvered vent at the front gable with a window with clear glass only. Is that what we're That's only? not divided. So. Um, anything else? I think that covers it, as far as I can remember. All right, so we got a motion by uh, Commissioner Meek. Second. second. We got a second by Commissioner Remy. Please vote in prime gov. All right, you are approved. Thank you for sticking it out with us. All right, uh, on to other business. So we have, um, do you need to go? Uh, yeah, probably pretty quick, but we can wrap well, it up real quick. Yeah, we'll, we're, we're at the end. Lots of administrative approvals. Um, feel, always contact staff if you guys have questions about any of those. Um, one withdrawal. Um, just not moving forward with that project. We have two items that uh, were on last month that were supposed to go to Board of Adjustment. They were both um, continued at the request of the various appellants for various reasons. Uh, there's nothing that the commission has to do for that. Staff attends those meetings to respond to any questions that the board may have. Uh, they do get a full copy of the um, meeting packet. They are send a recording of the meeting, all that sort of thing to hear what was discussed. Um, no other items under any of those categories for me. Municipal Councilor, none. Um, we are overdue to elect a chair and a vice chair. We're supposed to do that every year and we're past due. So we'll try to put that on next month. Think about if you would like to be chair or vice chair, let us know. Let your fellow commission members know. <laughs> Katie, does that mean we have seats to fill on the commission? No, we just, um, He's Every year we reappoint who's going to serve as chair and who's going to serve as vice chair, but it's from the current pool of commission members. Okay. So, and we've had chairs who served for years and years and years, and then we've had other periods where it cycled every year, so. It can still be tailored. It doesn't, okay. it doesn't have to move, correct? Yes. <laughs> the chair can't make motions, so right. if you are one of our strong motion makers, we won't let you be chair. <laughs> right. right, motion makers can't be chairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. All right, thank you all.
Um, this meeting is adjourned. Oh, any items from commissioners? Nope. Okay, we're adjourned. Citizens? No. No citizens? Okay. No citizens, yay. <laughs> no citizens left. Made it out. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I gotta run now, though. Go pick up my daughter before. Uh...